Good. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilman Rory Lansman, Chair of the Courts and Legal Services Committee, and welcome to this joint hearing with the Immigration Committee, chaired by Council Member Carlos Menchaca, on the presence of immigration and customs enforcement agents in courthouses. I want to thank Melissa Mark Verito, Viverito in particular, who could not be here this afternoon, for her strong leadership on this issue. Two weeks ago, ICE agents showed up at the Human Trafficking Intervention Court in Queens, a court dedicated to treating those arrested for low-level prostitution-related offenses with counseling and social services in lieu of jail time. They were there to arrest a woman who was about to have minor prostitution-related charges dismissed after completing her court-mandated series of programs, but who ICE wanted for overstaying her tourist visa. Rather than be released as planned, she asked that the charges not be dismissed, that bail be set, <clears throat> and that she be sent to Rikers Island rather than get arrested by ICE. Let me repeat that. She asked to be sent to Rikers Island to protect herself. Thankfully, ICE left before she was shipped off, to, shipped off to jail, and she was ultimately released. This is the choice too many immigrant New Yorkers are now being forced to confront. Show up in court or get deported. A survey released this morning by the Immigrant Defense Project found that 44 attorneys and advocates reported working with immigrants who were arrested by ICE in New York State courts. And it's not just criminal court. Litigants in civil court, housing court, and family court report being afraid to appear because ICE may be lurking. And it's not just litigants, but victims and witnesses as well. The integrity of our justice system is being undermined by ICE's refusal to designate courthouses as sensitive locations, like schools, hospitals, or houses of worship, where immigration enforcement actions are limited to extreme circumstances that present a public safety threat. And that makes all of us less safe. Even still, the federal government says that while courthouses do not fall under ICE or CBP policies, Customs and Border Patrol policies concerning enforcement actions at or focused on sensitive locations, I, enforcement actions at courthouses will only be executed against individuals falling within the public safety priorities of the Department of Homeland Security's immigration enforcement priorities. Meaning, even though courthouses are not sensitive locations, they are still supposed to be um, protected and ICE's presence in those courthouses defined and limited in the following way, according to the Department of Homeland Security. DHS's enforcement priorities are, have been, and will continue to be national security, border security, and public safety. DHS personnel are directed to prioritize the use of enforcement personnel, detention space, and removal assets accordingly. That obviously would not include a woman who is being sought merely because she overstayed her tourist visa. So it seems evident that in addition to disrupting the functioning of our courts and making immigrant New Yorkers fearful of any interaction with the justice system, ICE is even failing to follow its own policies. Court systems around the country are now struggling to address the unwillingness of the federal government to designate courthouses as sensitive locations. On April 26th of this year, New York's Office of Court Administration issued an updated policy governing law enforcement activity in courthouses. The policy, which is displayed on the screen there, requires any law enforcement official who does not have a judicial warrant to identify themselves to court security officers and state their specific purpose. A court security officer must file a report to document and track the enforcement and must notify a supervisor. That supervisor is then required to notify the judge if an individual appearing before the judge is being sought for arrest. And absent extraordinary circumstances, such as an extradition order, no arrest or other enforcement action may be taken inside the courtroom itself. Other courts, such as King County Superior Court in Washington State, have likewise banned ICE from effectuating courtroom arrests and have encouraged ICE not to make arrests in courthouses at all. 
and there is a growing list of states and courts and chief justices that have asked ICE to stay out of their courthouses. We regret that OCA has declined the opportunity to attend this hearing to share whatever information it has on ICE's operations in New York courthouses and to explain its policy governing ICE operations, which at this time appears to be among the most far-reaching of any jurisdiction in the country. We look forward to hearing from legal services providers, immigrant advocacy organizations, and others about what they are seeing in our courthouses and in immigrant communities, and what steps they believe the city and other governmental actors can take to defend the integrity of our judicial system. With that, I would like to invite uh, Council Member Carlos Menchaca, Chair of the Immigrant, uh, Immigration Committee, uh, for opening remarks, and I, and I believe a statement from the speaker. Thank you, Chair Lansman, and I want to give you all a, um, not just a good afternoon, but an afternoon that I think all of us are going to remember as a time where we stood up and fought back. I know that we are all feeling uh, tested right now on so many different levels, not just in our hearts, but in our system, our judicial system. So I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. I am Councilmember Carlos Menchaca, and I am the chair of the Committee on Immigration. And the city of New York has always deemed the safety of all New Yorkers our number one priority. To achieve that safety, we need to ensure that all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status, feel comfortable engaging with our local law enforcement and our local courts. Our city has long welcomed immigrants warmly, and today, our hearing is an affirmation that immigrants have the right to feel safe in their homes, in their schools, in their parks, in their churches, and in their municipal courts. This city council has repeatedly spoken out against the great injustices carried out by U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement agents, including the practice of arresting immigrants in our own courthouses. Just last week, we held a rally on the steps of City Hall to make clear that our city's courts must not be used as an area for ICE to conduct arbitrary arrests in order to meet their misguided quotas. Quor courts are a, are a place where New Yorkers go seek justice. They are not a place they should feel scared. Allowing immigration agents to stalk and arrest undocumented immigrants in courthouses undermines the integrity of the entire judicial system and denies immigrant New Yorkers equal access to justice. Just last week, three plainclothes agents appeared at the Queen's Human's Human Trafficking Intervention Court to arrest a young woman represented by the Legal Aid Society. After hours of advocacy and highly skilled lawyering, the legal aid attorneys were able to ensure that the client was not detained by ICE. This incident demonstrates that contrary to ICE's claims that they only pursue individuals who are a threat to public safety, ICE agents are targeting survivors of human trafficking. As if ICE's targeting some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers were not bad enough, when the ICE agents were not able to arrest the trafficking survival, survivor, they retaliated by randomly arresting three individuals outside the Queen's courthouse. This shows that when ICE is faced with delays or, un, or is unable to arrest their specific target, they will randomly arrest individuals regardless of whether that person has any criminal history or possesses a security risk. ICE is also targeting individuals in other courts throughout the city and the state. Recently, ICE agents arrested a father, the father of two, who was appearing in Suffolk County Family Court for a child visitation matter. The father, who was brought to the U.S., as a toddler by his family when they fled persecution in their country, is now indefinitely detained in an immigration jail. Immigration arrests at courthouses threaten the constitutional rights promised to all who are present in this country. They, are, they also create a chilling effect across immigrant communities. ICE courthouses, ICE courthouse arrests are shameful, predatory tactic that destroys the trust that our city officials and law enforcement officers have worked so hard to build between themselves and our immigrant community. Police officers, judges, and prosecutors across the country have long held that the assistance and cooperation from immigrant communities is crucial 
to maintaining public safety for all, to protect public safety and ensure equal enforcement of the law and help local and state law enforcement to do their jobs, immigrant victims and witnesses must feel comfortable filing reports with local law enforcement. But that in and of itself is just not enough. Immigrant victims and witnesses must feel comfortable to take that next step. They must feel comfortable cooperating with prosecutors by appearing in court. New York City is safer as a whole when all can access justice in our courts, seeking help from law enforcement and get, attempt, get information about their rights in our court. Luckily, a coalition of local and state entities as well as advocates and service providers have come together to address, address ICE's presence in New York courthouses. In fact, the Office of Court Administration, OCE, recently implemented protocols for court officers and staff on how to handle law enforcement presence in courthouses. These protocols are meant to ensure that the courts remain a safe place and that access to justice is not obstructed by unfettered enforcement activity. I commend OCA for instituting these protocols and look forward to working closely with them and advocates to enhance them wherever possible. I also want to commend the advocates who have been working tirelessly to monitor ICE's presence in the courts, track the detrimental impact it has on immigrant communities, and develop recommendations on how to protect immigrant New Yorkers. I thank you for your time, your service, your hard work, and continued partnership. This hearing is truly a testament to the City Council's commitment to doing everything we can to not only support our immigrant communities and making our city safe for all New Yorkers, but also our commitment to defending the integrity of our court system. La ciudad de Nueva York siempre ha sido y ha considerado la seguridad de todos los neoyorquinos nuestra primera prioridad. Para lograr esa seguridad, debemos asegurarnos de que todos los neoyorquinos, todos, sin importar su estatus migratorio, se sientan cómodos comprometiéndose con nuestra policía local aquí en Nueva York y con nuestros tribunales locales. Nuestra ciudad siempre ha, ha dado una calorosa bienvenida a los inmigrantes y la audiencia hoy es una afirmación de que los inmigrantes tienen derecho a sentirse seguros en su hogar, las escuelas, y también en sus tribunales municipales. Esta audiencia es verdaderamente verdad, un testimonio de compromiso del Consejo Municipal de hacer todo posible, todo, no solo para apoyar a nuestras comunidades inmigrantes y hacer que nuestra ciudad sea segura para todos los neoyorquinos. And now I'm going to read Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito's statement. For the record, thank you all for coming to provide insight for this important hearing. I want to thank the chairs uh, of the committees, Rory Lansman of the Courts, and Com uh, Courts Committee and Carlos Menchaca of the Immigration Committee for all their hard work on this issue. As I have said many times since the presidential election, ICE enforcement in the courthouses undermines our justice system and impedes access to justice for our most vulnerable residents and makes our city less safe and it must be stopped. The recent attempt by ICE to arrest a woman in human trafficking court confirmed our worst suspicions about ICE's intentions. They are not targeting hardened criminals. They are looking for anyone they can get their hands on, no matter the depth of their roots in the community or the nature of their appearance in court. Over the last few months, I have been in close communication with the Chief Judge De Fiori and other high-ranking Office of the Court Administration officials to stress the urgency of addressing this issue. I want to commend the New York Chief Judge Janet DeFiori and Chief Administrative Judge Lawrence Marks for implementing groundbreaking protocols regarding ICE and other law enforcement activities in New York State courts. These protocols, which regulate law enforcement activity, including immigration enforcement in the state's courthouses, are a great first step and send a clear message that we will not tolerate the unnecessary degradation of our justice system. With these protocols, the Chief Judge is leading the way nationally to ensure that ICE does not strip away litigants' rights to access justice. I hope that other jurisdictions take note of, the, of these protocols and implement their own protocols. 
The integrity of our civil and criminal justice systems as well as the safety of our residents and our nation depends on it. While these protocols are a significant and much needed first step, I urge OCA to monitor their implementation closely and enhance them by further restricting disruptive enforcement activity in courthouses and barring arrest by ICE or any other enforcement agency within the courthouses. In addition to OCA, I would like to thank the Immigrant, Immigrant Defense Project, the Legal Aid Society, Her Justice, Latino Justice, Pro Def, Sanctuary for Families, Bronx Legal Services, and Make the Road New York for their tireless, tireless tracking of ICE activity in our courts, as well as, other, oh, as, well as their continued advocacy with OCA regarding ICE activity. I would also, again, like to thank the chairs for their incredible work and the oversight of today uh, and explore, to explore the recommendations heard for further limiting ICE's seemingly unbridled enforcement in our courthouses. And with that, I'll hand that back to the chair. Oh, and we're going to do a Spanish, another Spanish version. Buenos días a todos que nos unen hoy y muchas gracias por su tiempo, su testimonio y sus observaciones y recomendaciones. Eh, la audiencia hoy es muy importante porque, como ya lo saben, ha habido una escala escalación de eh, esfuerzos para arrestar a inmigrantes en nuestros tribunales criminales y civiles aquí en la ciudad de Nueva York, en el estado de Nueva York y en todo el país. Estos arrestos nos ponen en mucho, mucho peligro, no solo los inmigrantes, pero todos los neoyorquinos, porque cuando los inmigrantes tienen miedo de reportar crímenes, de eh, cooperar con los abogados, la prosecución de un caso, eh, y se quedan callados y no, no cooperan, todos estamos a riesgo. Uh, hoy quiero agradecerle mucho a la, um, al juez Janet De Fiore por sus nuevas reglas que limitan cómo ICE puede eh, funcionar en nuestras cortes criminales y civiles. Estas nuevas reglas aseguran que los inmigrantes pueden eh, accesar el sistema judicial en la misma manera que cualquier otro neoyorquino, sea nacido aquí en los Estados Unidos o en otra parte del mundo. También quiero darle las gracias por trabajar tan uh, cercamente con nosotros y con los grupos comunitarios cuando estaban eh, pensando sobre estas reglas y esperamos que trabajen con nosotros eh, en la implementación de estas reglas también. También les quiero dar muchas gracias a los grupos comunitarios que han estado eh, tan cercamente vigilando qué es lo que está pasando en nuestras cortes, hablando con sus clientes y documentando el miedo que ellos sienten y también documentando eh, cuántas veces ellos retiran su, su, sus quejas o no quieren cooperar por miedo de ser arrestados por ICE. Eh, la presencia de ICE en nuestras cortes realmente es una, un, un impedimento para todos los que están buscando justicia en nuestras cortes, sea un tribunal criminal o civil. Entonces, muchas gracias al presidente del Comité de Cortes, eh, concejal Lansman, y el presidente del Comité de Inmigración, concejal Menchaca, por esta audiencia hoy. Y otra vez, muchas gracias por su testimonio y presencia aquí. Thank you, Indiana for that. Uh, and I want to also welcome uh, from the Immigration Committee uh, from Queens, Peter Koo. Uh, from Brooklyn, we have Matthew Jean and Rafael Espinal. Thank you. Also, we've been joined from the Committee on Courts and Legal Services, Council Member uh, Andrew Cohen and Paul Vallone. With that, um, if you all would raise your right hand, we can swear you in and we can get started. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Terrific. Um, who would like to lead off? Great. If the Sergeant at Arms would set the clock at five minutes and go. Oh, thank you. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to speak on this critical issue of ICE arrests in New York City courts. My name is Andrew Wachtenheim, and I am a supervising attorney with the Immigrant Defense Project, which works to protect and expand the rights of those caught in the intersection of the criminal justice system, the child welfare system, and the immigration system. For years, IDP has monitored ICE operations in New York State 
and has seen firsthand the transition from President Obama to President Trump and the sudden escalation of ICE presence inside New York State courthouses. In the first six months of 2017, we have seen triple the number of courthouse arrests as in all of 2016. So what is it that ICE is doing when it comes into New York State courts? They are accessing court files without subpoena to obtain identifying and other sensitive and confidential information about litigants. They are asking court staff to delay arraignment and change court calendars to facilitate arrest. They are physically trapping arrest targets inside courthouses. And as recent events indicate, and as Council Member Manchaka spoke about, when unable to arrest the person that they want, they are going around the courthouse to look for others. And who is it that ICE is arresting inside our courts? They are arresting an extraordinary diversity of, of New York State's immigrants, which includes lawful permanent residents, green card holders, people with pending applications for protected status. They are arresting people with significant mental health issues and survivors of violence. ICE's representations that they are going after a certain kind of immigrant or that they are going to courthouses for a specific reason is a fallacy. The group of people that ICE has apprehended inside New York State courts in 2017 is, ver is entirely indistinguishable from the many more people that they are arresting at their homes and at their workplaces and on the streets. There is no reason for ICE to be going into courthouses specifically. Nationwide, judges and policymakers have publicly called on ICE to stop this practice, citing the tremendous threat to public safety and to the constitutional underpinnings of our court systems. In New York State, we at IDP, along with coalition partners, surveyed the lawyers and advocates statewide who work with the immigrant and mixed status communities that are directly impacted by ICE's presence inside the courts. These are the lawyers and advocates who represent the people who are afraid to enter a courthouse to seek protection and to participate in a basic and fundamental component of civil life. And what our survey shows is that 75% of the more than 200 advocates surveyed have worked with immigrants who have expressed fear of the courts because of ICE. And of those who work with survivors of violence, 67% have had clients who decided not to seek help from the courts due to fear of ICE, which includes declining to seek orders of protection and failing to seek custody or visitation with their children because of fear of immigration agents. In the housing court arena, 56% of housing court advocates have, ha have clients who have expressed fear of filing a housing court complaint due to fear of ICE. ICE has publicly responded that it will not stop doing this and that it will continue with this practice exactly as it sees fit. And what else can we expect from an agency that went to make an arrest in a human trafficking intervention court and recently went to a family court ordered supervised visit between a child and parent in New Jersey in order to take that father into custody. I respect the judges and policymakers, including our state's chief judge, who have approached ICE and, the, and our attorney general to engage in a civil conversation and to ask them politely to stop coming into our courts. But further conversation with ICE and with the attorney general is futile. The agency has publicly defended its practice of entering the state courts to make arrests and to obtain information. This is an agency that zealously guards its ability to arrest anyone that it wants, wherever it wants to do it. And moreover, this is an agency that is disingenuous and often dishonest in communicating about the way it does its job. ICE purports to be an agency that tries to protect public safety, but then why does it park its vans outside of, New York, outside of New York's Family Justice Center? Why does it track a woman in Texas from the domestic violence shelter where she was living to the court appearance where she sought an order of protection against her abusive partner? ICE is not going to stop coming into our courts of its own volition. They have given every indication that they will continue to do this and with greater frequency and an ever widening net of people that they want to arrest. The intervention must come from the New York State government, and part of that intervention must come from our chief judge and chief administrative judge. Our state's constitution and judiciary law, may I continue, Councilman? You can conclude. We, okay. we want to have the opportunity to ask you questions. Okay. Um, it is our position that it would be perfect, it is perfectly appropriate and defensible for our 
chief judge to promulgate rules that will protect our courts, and we, it is our belief that this is what needs to happen in order to stop this practice. Thank you for considering my testimony, and I would welcome the opportunity to answer any questions that would help the council to better understand the parameters of this pernicious problem. Thank you. That's that last part I do want to ask you questions about, so trust me, you'll have an opportunity. Thank you. Um, who wants to go next? Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chairman Lansman and Chairman Menchaca for convening these hearings to discuss ICE in our courtrooms. My name is Stan Herman, and I'm the Executive Director of New York County Defender Services here in Manhattan. Before continuing with my prepared remarks, let me say that I do not share this Council's optimism with regard to the leadership that is coming from OCA, and that memorandum represents nothing more than recycled policies that have been around forever, and ICE does not appear anywhere in that memorandum. But to continue, before my colleagues from the other defender offices provide this council with ideas about what the Office of Court Administration can and should be doing to protect our immigrant community's access to justice, I want to give a brief overview of what has transpired over the last six months with respect to ICE in our courthouses. In early February of this year, the defenders were planning a press conference to address the disturbing tone emanating from the executive branch in Washington, D.C., following the January 20th inauguration. The event, however, was preempted because on February 18th, 2017, ICE agents were seen in a Manhattan criminal court arraignment part to take a person into custody. It was the first time that anyone could recall the presence of ICE in an arraignment courtroom only 24 hours after an arrest of an individual. And the event set off alarm bells among everyone who was concerned about protecting our immigrant population. Three days later, on February 21st, Chairman Lansman, joined by the defenders and members of the community, held a press conference on the steps of City Hall, drawing attention to the issue of ICE in our courtrooms. In response to the press conference, the defenders met with members of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, as well as the Office of Court Administration, and we were told that OCA had no contingency plans in place to deal with what everyone knew would become a real issue after January 20th of this year, ICE in our courts. In the wake of no leadership or action plan by OCA officials, we saw disturbing trends among New York City and New York State judges. Some judges were suddenly making inquiries about clients' immigration status and even highlighting those who were foreign-born. The head of the state's court officer union, Dennis Quirk, declared that court officers must cooperate with ICE. Once again, no leadership or action plan by OCA officials. At a criminal court arraignment on March 11, 2017, I'm going to read you part of a transcript that took place in conjunction with an arraignment. The court, quote, it also appears that ICE should be contacted if you haven't already. ICE, remember them? The prosecutor responds, yes, Your Honor. The court, in a sarcastic tone, says, immigration, customs, enforcement. Finally, on June 16th of this year, the incident that directly led to all of us gathering here today occurred when victims, oh, I missed one page, I apologize. On April 5th, the defenders met with the OCA's Office of Chief, uh, Chief Administrative Judge, and we were essentially told that there was no need for concern, but that they would monitor the situation and encouraged us to report any ICE presence in the courtrooms. We, will, we all warned OCA that this is simply the beginning of increased ICE presence in the courts and that a proactive and not a reactive approach must be taken. As requested by OCA during the ensuing two months, all of the public defender offices of New York City reported every instance of ICE in our courtrooms. We communicated with each other and with OCA every time one of our clients were taken away by ICE officials when our clients simply appeared in court voluntarily as required to do so. ICE presence was spotted in all five boroughs, and we all heard and all we heard from OCA was silence. No leadership, no bold action, simply silence. Finally, on June 16th of this year, the incident that directly led to all of us gathering here today occurred when victims were taken away by ICE officials when they appeared in the Queens Human Trafficking Intervention Court. At last, we heard from our Chief Judge Janet DeFiori 
that she was, quote, greatly concerned and that they would talk to ICE. Still no leadership, still no plan of action. The time for talking is done. We need action to protect our immigrant communities' access to justice, and it is incumbent on OCA leadership to take bold and innovative steps. Thank you. I'm Tina Longo, and I'm the attorney in charge of the criminal practice at Legal Aid Society, but I s sit here um, also um, representing uh, the Legal Aid Society's other two practices, our civil practice and our juvenile rights practice. Uh, I cannot um, understate what Stan uh, just testified to. Um, every single day, public defenders are in our courts and legal services lawyers in, are in our courts to protect, to surround, to reinforce the tenets of justice for probably 300,000 families, not clients, but families. So whether it's in criminal court or civil court or immigration court, if you're going there for a housing matter, or as a, a member of our immigration law unit reminded me, we represent children as part of the I Care Coalition who are undocumented, unaccompanied minor children in family court who are seeking adjustment of their status. We're hearing fears. We are seeing people not show. We are watching our clients be shackled and taken away from their families. And what we have asked for from OCA is at a minimum, at a minimum, let us know as the attorneys so that we can speak to our client so we can prepare them for what might happen, so that we can call their family to say, I'm sorry to tell you the bad news, but your father, your mother, your child, your loved one is not coming home. They're probably at Hudson or Orange. They're about to be put in deportation. And I know nothing else. Because when we have found out after the fact, when we've asked to see a warrant to get information, we are told there is no warrant. I can't provide you any information. So what we have had to do, not only, and Kate will sort of, uh, my colleague will, will sort of talk about the Queen's matter, but what we have had to do, not only in that case, but in a case in the Bronx, is set bail, where our client had to sit in for two weeks until, by the way, we corrected the information that ICE had wrong, and that client was released. Because the other thing that is happening to the defenders in this city is that because the state has agreed with the federal government to not give us a document called the NCIC, our lawyers, our public defenders, the people who you contract that is mandated to represent people in this city against, in their criminal proceedings, doesn't have the back sheet of a rap sheet that says that ICE may want them or that they have, they, they have an issue, so we can't correct it ahead of time. So in that case, and in many cases, we found out after the fact, and then we had to correct the issues to try to get our clients out. So excuse us if we are a little frustrated by the notion that this policy is groundbreaking. Because this policy does not, this stands for all law enforcement. And what do we know? ICE is not NYPD. NYPD has to give warnings, right? We're allowed to invoke warnings. We're allowed to say, don't talk to our client. We're allowed to say, you're to bring the person back within 24 hours to meet another public defender. There is process and due process embedded in that system that allows a client to then be advised of their rights and then brought before another court to say whether or not there is reasonable suspicion, probable cause, um, something that we can then fight to protect. We have none of that. So when we talk about general law enforcement policies, let's be straight. That isn't going to protect our clients. What is going to protect our clients, and others will talk about this, is getting ICE out of our courtrooms. And at a minimum, right now, right now, 
every public defender and every lawyer who has a client in a courthouse where ICE is there should be told ahead of time, not by luck, not by circumstance, and not by a brave judge who probably broke a rule by telling the lawyer that ICE was there on Friday. And on that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Kate. I am Kate Mogulescu. I am the supervising attorney of the Exploitation Intervention Project in the Legal Aid Society's criminal defense practice. Our team represents um, individuals arrested and charged with prostitution offenses in the human trafficking intervention courts and victims of human trafficking charged with a whole host of other offenses um, in New York City's criminal courts. It was our team that represented the woman whose case council member Lanceman described at the beginning of the hearing. Um, and we were in court and notified by the judge when we were on the record. Um, that was the first that we learned that there were three ICE deportation officers in court looking to detain our client. I, I agree with Tina and Stan that this policy is not what allowed us to prevent that client from being taken into custody. It was the fact that the court notified us and we were able to scramble, admittedly, and while I certainly appreciate Councilmember Menchaca's characterizing our lawyering as highly skilled, I'll take that any time I can get it, that wasn't what this was. This was panic, this was deep concern, this was terrifying for the client and her family, and this was us trying to figure out what to do in a moment's notice, but we had that moment's notice, and that's why we were able to act. The numerous other people that were taken into custody in Queens Criminal Court that day did not have that benefit, and we don't even, we have no idea who those people even are. Um, so I, I agree that this policy here, which does not mandate that lawyers be notified, um, is not what allowed us to advocate for our client and prevent her being taken into custody on June 16th. Um, it is also worth pointing out here that while we share in all of the outrage and shock that this happened in a human trafficking intervention court, we really can't be very surprised. The human trafficking intervention courts are criminal courts. People come into them by virtue of their own arrest. This is a question of arrest policy and who is being brought into criminal court and sort of sitting as sitting ducks for potential ICE enforcement. I know this council, our organization, many of the organizations represented here today have done a lot to try to make the trafficking intervention courts as least harmful as possible for the people coming through them. But nothing will make them safe from, for example, immigration enforcement when they're criminal courts, and this is a question fundamentally of who's coming into criminal court, who's vulnerable to being taken into custody, and what can we do about it? So when we think about standing up and fighting back, um, as Councilmember Menchaca said at the beginning, what can we actually do? Well, I've sat in this very chamber before and talked about our arrest policy when it comes to prostitution arrests. This woman um, in the Queens case was arrested in a massage parlor in Queens in February. Law enforcement in massage parlors in this city has skyrocketed over the last several years. We have seen an unbelievable jump of arrests of primarily foreign nationals in massage parlors throughout the city. Um, a report that we just released with the Urban Institute shows that these, the, these arrests increased over 1,900 percent between 2012 and 2016. This is a crisis. Of those clients that we represent who are arrested in massage parlors, 91% are not U.S. citizens, 37% are undocumented. These are the people that are coming into the human trafficking intervention courts. So arrest policy, what are, what are we seeing here and what can we do about it? That's the conversation that we need to have. The second, and I, because I suspect that that is a long conversation that we're probably going to continue to have over many years, I may be sitting here many years from now making the exact same point, is what creative approaches can we do to really take the lead here? Efforts that have stalled on pre-arrest diversion, pre-arraignment diversion, keeping people out of criminal courts so they are less vulnerable to these collateral harms, that's what we need to be talking about. And I would be happy to make several recommendations about that that I think would benefit this, this population and the population that we're all concerned about in this room. Finally, we need to be looking at our procedures in these criminal courts, even in our diversion courts. Um, the woman that appeared in this case that we keep talking about, 
had already done everything the court had asked for her, of, of her and had already appeared three times in that court. She was there to get her charges dismissed. So we should be thinking about how long are we forcing people to be involved in courts? How many times are we making them come back? How protracted is this involvement? And does that increase vulnerability as well? So I'd be happy to take any questions about any of those points um, after we finish. Hi, I'm Zachary Ahmed. I'm a policy counsel with the New York Civil Liberties Union. Uh, the NYCLU is an affiliate of the ACLU, and it is our mission to promote and protect the fundamental rights, principles, and values embodied in the U.S. Constitution and the New York State Constitution. That includes, fundamentally, the rights of individuals to participate meaningfully in the judicial process, to enjoy equal access to the courts, and to be afforded due process of law. We're pleased that the City Council is taking steps to raise awareness of this urgent issue. We are all aware, as we are all aware, arrests by ICE have spiked dramatically under the current administration. Among the cruelest and most misguided tactics used by ICE is the practice of arresting people when they appear in state courthouses for matters wholly unrelated to their immigration status. These actions undermine the basic constitutional guarantees of due process and threaten the integrity of New York's court system. Though this practice is not new, the targeting of immigrants, as you've heard already, for arrests at courthouses has become more frequent and more brazen. It can't be argued anymore, as ICE has claimed in the past, that its courthouse enforcement tactics only target those who pose a threat to public safety. Rather, these actions reflect the attitude, stated bluntly by ICE's acting director recently, that immigrants without lawful status should be uncomfortable. The impact of ICE's courthouse enfor enforcement tactics are far-reaching, and I'm sure you'll hear more about that throughout the day, as you already have. Our testimony today focuses on how ICE's actions undermine due process of law and the deeply rooted constitutional right to access the courts. As, laid out, as is laid out more fully in our written testimony, the Supreme Court has long recognized that the access to the courts is an essential component of liberty and due process. The constitutional guarantee of due process arising under the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments of the U.S. Constitution demands that individuals be afforded a meaningful opportunity to be heard in the courts. For those accused of crimes, the notion of a fair trial requires that the defendant have a chance to appear in court and confront their witnesses. These guarantees of due process cannot be realized when individuals are intimidated from availing themselves of the courts in the first place. The right to court access is not just a matter of due process, but of equal protection of the law. Courts must be made equally accessible to all people without unreasoned distinctions. A practice that makes courts less accessible to immigrants works to create an underclass that is denied the basic rights and benefits afforded to others. This offends the notion of equal protection under the law embedded in the U.S. Constitution. The right to court access is also rooted in the First Amendment right to petition, which protects the, right of individuals to the rights of individuals to turn to the courts to resolve legal disputes. The right to petition the government for redress of grievances cannot be separated from the rights of freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly. Practices that infringe on an individual's right to petition the courts run contrary to the notion of justice built into the constitutional system. ICE's enforcement actions in and around court, New York courthouses undermine these fundamental rights by chilling free and open access to the courts. Our state courts are often the exclusive venue for New Yorkers to resolve legal matters involving personal safety, family relations, parental rights, criminal justice, and fair access to housing. When immigrants face the, pro the prospect of interrogation and arrest by ICE when they file for custody of their children, petition for child support, or respond to a summons, they are effectively denied the opportunity to, vindica to vindicate their rights under the law. In a state with roughly 4.3 million foreign-born residents, these concerns are very real, as you've heard. ICE's courthouse enforcement tactics contribute to a tiered justice system wherein an entire class of individu individuals cannot depend on the courts to ensure their protection under the law. The consequences of this are broadly felt. Immigrants subject to domestic violence may be reluctant to seek orders of protection against their abusers. Foreign-born workers who suffer harassment or discrimination in the workplace may, may choose to endure such treatment rather than bring actions against their employers. Victims of crimes may be will, unwilling to testify in court or may avoid bringing crimes to light in the first instance. Ensuring the right to be heard in court requires the government to do more than just open its courthouse doors. Where fundamental rights are at stake, the government must remove, to ba must remove barriers that prevent certain classes of people from meaningfully accessing the courts to vindicate those rights if the promises of due process and equal protection are to be realized. 
Just as New York may not maintain its court system in a way that denies individuals the opportunity to be heard, it should not tolerate external threats to judicial fairness that undermine equal access to its court system. We welcome the City Council's efforts to bring needed attention to this issue. ICE's actions threaten the constitutional rights of immigrant New Yorkers and interfere with the administration of justice in ways that we can only begin to measure and in ways that I'm sure you'll hear more about as this hearing continues. We look forward to hearing we look forward to working with the City Council on ways to address this matter and ensure that New York's courthouses in New York City and across the state are open and accessible to all. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Justine Olderman. I'm the Managing Director of the Bronx Defenders. I also want to thank the Council for holding this hearing. And while I'm always grateful for the opportunity to testify and be in dialogue with the Council on the issues that are most pressing to us and our clients, in this respect, today, I'm particularly thankful. The reason I'm particularly thankful is I think that there is an enormous danger here of complacency. There is a danger that eventually we will all become inured to the presence of ICE in our courthouses, that we will become inured to the ways in which it is upending our criminal court process, faith in our judicial institutions, the impact that it's having on attorney-client relationships, and obviously, most importantly, the impact that it's having on not just immigrant New Yorkers involved in the criminal justice system, but their families and entire communities. I can sit here just like all of the other defenders, and I can attest, and to the extent you're interested in it, I can dive deep into the ways in which, in fact, what we are seeing every day on the ground is, in fact, impeding the functioning of the courts. And I can attest firsthand to the ways in which it is impeding, as has already been commented on, access to justice for immigrant New Yorkers who are seeking to avail themselves of their constitutional rights in our court system. And I can attest to the ways every single day that we see clerks, court officers, judges, and prosecutors be complicit in using our court system as an enforcement playground for immigration officials. And I could attest to the ways in which it is transforming the way we as defense attorneys engage with our clients as we have to give them really difficult advice about whether they should choose to avail themselves of their constitutional rights, come back to court for their court dates, and yet at the same time risk not making it home at night to kiss their loved ones and tuck their children into bed. I can give you details about all of that. But everybody has also touched on that, and I think I wouldn't be telling you anything that you don't already know and aren't aware of. So the question is, where do we go from here? What we have had so far, we've had data collection, we've had assessing the situation, and we've had sharing concerns with OCA. We have had enough data collection, and we haven't had plenty of time to assess, and OCA has had plenty of opportunity to share their concerns. What we need now, at this moment in time, to make sure that this city actually can be what it claims to be, a sanctuary city, so that ICE does not end up upending our judicial institutions in this city and across this state, what we need, as has already been commented on, is we need bold action. And is that going to be hard? 100% that's going to be hard. But you know what? Justice often is hard. And what we are hearing is, well, I'm not quite sure we can make that distinction. How do we do that? What I come back and say, we haven't even begun to try. We haven't seen anything from OCA to indicate that they are even engaged in a very real way of trying to figure out, is there a legal mechanism by which not just give notification to lawyers, that's easy, of course they should be doing that, but to actually prevent these arrests from taking place in our courthouses. Our courthouses are not like the public street. It's not a park. We don't have the same freedoms and rights to engage in whatever behavior we want inside of the halls of a hallowed institution like a courthouse. It is different. It is fundamentally different. I can't protest up and down the halls of the criminal court building in the Bronx as much as many times I would like to do so. Arguably and rightfully, that would upend court process. Guess what else upends court process? Ice in our courthouses. And one of the things that's so great about the example, excuse me, that's probably the worst word I could use, but what is helpful for this dialogue of what happened in Queens is because there was a reporter there, because of the amazing work of the Legal Aid Society and Kate and the attention that has been brought to bear on that instance, everyone can feel in a visceral way the panic 
not just for that particular client in that particular moment, but the scrambling of lawyers and advocates to try to figure out what to do, how to manage it. That is not just happening in specialty parts. That is happening every single day across our courthouses. I can be a witness in the litigation that says, is it in fact upending court process? And attest to the fact, under oath, 100% that it is. Everybody who has testified here is exactly right. We need bold action. The time is now. If, in fact, we are to preserve our judicial institutions, protect immigrant communities, uphold our Constitution, and give at least a modicum of meaning of what it means to be a sanctuary city, we need action, and we need it now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, let me just mention we've been joined by council members uh, Danny Drum and uh, Barry Grudenchik. Um, yeah. So um, let's get right into it. There are some who think that this policy uh, is the limit of what OCA has the authority to do, that uh, the courtrooms, at least the, 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 the hallways and the common areas, are public areas, um, that law enforcement is engaged in uh, law enforcement activities all the time in the courthouse, whether it's the NYPD or the FBI or state troopers or, or, or you name it. What more do you believe uh, OCA has the authority to do? And what is the basis for that? Whoever wants to start. Admittedly, this is not my area of expertise, but as I just alluded to, there is a fundamental difference between the law enforcement activities that we see that even result in arrests in our courthouse and have since the beginning of time and what we are seeing here. When NYPD goes into our courthouses and they have probable cause to make an arrest and they do so, let's say, right outside of a courtroom, it does not trigger in every single person sitting in that courtroom or in the hallways outside, both people who are litigants and, pe and the public who are there, it does not trigger a fear in them that they too could be arrested. It's not the nature of it. The very nature of the action is different, and that's where the differentiation lies. That is why NYPD coming in and making a targeted arrest does not necessarily trigger or rather upend court process the way that we're seeing. I, I understand that, but, but that doesn't necessarily, necessarily give OCA greater authority to limit ICE's operations because ICE has a greater impact. I'm not saying that they... They lack that authority, but does, has anyone given thought to... So this notion of the, pub, the hallways are public, I sort of want to push back on that, right? I think that's what Justine said. Like, you can't actually protest. Court officers actually can stop people from coming in um, because it is either uh, disruptive to the process or uh, a safety issue, um, both of which OCA could rely on to literally say, we're not going to let you. The notion also of law enforcement and whether ICE is law enforcement, I sort of think we're stretching it. Most of these agents are civil. The detainers that they claim to have are generated internal paperwork that is civil. So in the context of the criminal court, what we then have to admit is we are allowing a civil servant of the federal government to come in and actually drag somebody out of a Sixth Amendment constitutional due process procedure, their case, without the benefit of a lawyer, because our hallways are public? If our hallways were public, then the court, then the court officers couldn't stop anybody from coming in, right? It's public. Uh, right? They, so they're not. Are they perhaps quasi-public? Yes, but then you could actually lay out a set of procedures and protocols. There's also city, uh, we've also sort of raised this with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and, that per, and the Speaker's Office to say, uh, perhaps there's a city function. You own the buildings. There is an HR, a case that HRA was able to keep um, an organization, I believe it was Make the Road, out of their reception areas because it was disruptive and it was upheld by the appellate courts to be that they have a right to do that. We've raised that. We've given that memo to the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. So, I don't necessarily think that we should fold on this notion 
that there's nothing could we can do because those buildings are public, because there is a landlord, the city of New York, and there is, I'm going to use the phrase tenant, being OCA, and aren't there contractual obligations that could be put in place? And frankly, here's what I'd like to throw out too. Do something, somebody, and let the federal government try to sue us. We have really smart people in the city and state that would maybe take this on since we are a sanctuary city. And uh, if, please. If I could, this, this notion that somehow it's just happening in the hallways, let's be clear about what's happening. OCA and their employees are aiding and abetting in this process. When a ICE official calls up the court part and says, do me a favor, Mr. Clerk, don't call the case until 2.15 in the afternoon so that when I get there at 2.15, the person is still in court. When you go up to a court officer and say, can you call this person's name out so I could identify who that person is and make an arrest before his or her lawyer gets there, that is aiding and abetting. When a judge says this person was foreign born, you need to look into this and contact ICE. That's aiding and abetting. We have no obligation to help ICE in this function as a sanctuary city in New York City. So those are just a few examples of ways in which OCA can take action with their employees and say, you know what, OCA employees, this is going to be our position with respect to ICE. But they have refused to do even Even short of banning ICE from the courthouses, there are things that OCA could do beyond the, the what's in what's in that memo, which would limit ICE's ability to, to operate. We could make it as hard as possible for ICE to do their job. I, I want to hear from you, and then I want to give everyone else an opportunity, without conceding the point that OCA has the authority to ban ICE entirely, whether or not there are other um, procedural steps that OCA could require, other other uh, prohibitions in terms of its own employees. Uh, cooperating that would also be um, helpful to just expand on that policy but but go ahead um, well this is impartial answer to that question um, you know when we're thinking when we're asking the question of what can OCA or what can Chief Judge DeFiore do to push back on this inappropriate um, arrest pr practice by federal immigration agents the question is not what can the chief judge do to regulate federal immigration agents? The question is, what can the chief judge do to protect her courts and the administrative, and administration of justice within her courts? And the answer is, she can do quite a lot. There is ample precedent nationwide and across history where states and entities and localities within states regulate their institutions and their public spaces and that has the effect of protecting the rights of the immigrants who live within our states and within our communities to participate in the basic functions of daily life, like going to court as a criminal defendant, like going to court to complain about an exploitative landlord, like seeking an order of protection. And so, you know, the question is really, what can the chief judge do in order to make sure, as these panels have pointed out, that these courts are functioning as they should be and in a non-discriminatory fashion? And as I'm sure that many of the panelists here will talk about, there are a number of steps that she could she could plausibly take that would be quite legally defensible and that go beyond what's in this memo because this was pr th from what i see here this was issued in april of 2017 it's been 2 months since then and the number so, of so what are some things um, what, some things that we've considered at IDP that I've heard suggested by others on this panel yeah. are prohibitions on information sharing um, between court staff and the federal government, which is certainly an, it's certainly um, within the judge's inherent authority to regulate the administration of justice. There could be warrant requirements, as I've heard Tina suggest um, in the in, in, in in our recent rally. And these, you know, some of this would be this would be directing what court staff can be doing, the way in which they should and can be doing their jobs. Um, they should not be participating in federal immigration enforcement. It's not their job. The warrant requirement that Tina's spoken about, and, I think Any other ideas, specific? No, I think ideas? this notion of not making it easy. So in the case in Queens, for example, one of the, the deportation officers didn't come specifically for that one client. They came with a list. 
They came with a list of individuals they believed were going to be in court that day, and they were happy to get any very, I mean, they were not, I don't believe that ICE woke up that morning and said, we're going to go to the human trafficking court and get a trafficking victim to detain. They came with a list of people who were appearing in criminal court in Queens County. What they, what was interesting about the experience in our courtroom, though, was that they needed to see this person appear on the record to confirm who she was. They couldn't figure out for whatever other reason, and maybe it was that their photos were older or because there are in Queens Court on any Friday morning a high number of Chinese and Korean women, women appearing in that court. And so in order to verify the identity of the person they were seeking to detain, they wanted a visual of the case being called on the record. And there was a lot of back and forth about that. So again, it's about making it easy for them, right? When we know that they're there to look for someone, not becoming an accomplice in that. Um, I had a lengthy conversation with one of the deportation officers that was present in Queens Court. I asked numerous times for any detainers, warrants, paperwork that we could see to understand who they were there to detain and what their basis was. Not only would he not provide me any, he said he did not have any. They just had a list of people that they were coming to get. So unlike when NYPD comes into the courtroom to execute a warrant, I mean the courthouse to execute a warrant, where we very clearly see who they're there for, what their authority is, and then there are the other checks that Tina mentioned down the road. Here, this is just, there is nothing to verify, there is nothing to check, and we should be building in that at each step of the way. The, the, what NYPD does when it shows up, is that covered by any OCA rule, or that's just how NYPD operates in the courthouses? So, so I wonder if, if there's a possibility for us to say, for example, to OCA, this is how NYPD operates. At the very least, you should require the same of, of ICE. Look, I, I think that they are, the procedure uh, might be the same. We ha often will uh, ha want to say, wh why aren't you calling my client? And they will say, well, because we're waiting for NYPD. Um, again, I sort of want to point out two things. Whether or not that they're acting on a warrant or whether they're acting on reasonable suspicion because there's a complaint, um, the, the due process requirement does really make it different. This is law enforcement in New York City that's about to arrest somebody for a, a, a crime or a, an allegation of a crime in New York City that's going to come back to New York City courts and be under the authority of the Constitution and be provided a public defender or have an attorney that they can pay. That is not the case with ICE, and in fact, there, again, I'm going to sort of question, I know we're using the term law enforcement to mean ICE agents, not exactly law enforcement, not exactly probable cause or reasonable suspicion. In fact, much of their information is outdated as our immigration law unit sort of parses out how many times they have gotten the wrong information on this civil signed by a supervisor in their office saying, hey, go get this person, right? So I think that they're like they're apples and oranges in many ways, in particular in, in this instance, and we have to treat it that way. The thing that everybody sort of references attributed to me is I just keep saying, look, New York City Council and, and the mayor signed off on a great detainer law that actually protects people that are housed at Rikers, which is why we have started to ask for bail. Right, because the detainer law allows us to protect our clients. Why? Because in, ICE won't get that person unless they show a warrant that says a judge in a court vetted the accuracy of that information and has now said you have a basis according to the federal judicial system and my authority under the law to go get that person. How about we just do that? My last um, question, has, have any of you considered the question of whether or not whatever OCA would require of ICE or prevent ICE to do, it would have to require or prevent all law enforcement or similar agencies, otherwise we'd run into a problem of our discriminating against the federal government. That was something that was raised in, in our research in this issue. Yeah, I'll just say that I think that that's exactly where all of the information and experience that we have and the data collection we have comes into play, which is to say that while, in fact, the the one could make the argument that the behavior is similar, that, as Tina pointed out, they are not the same. 
in terms of whether one is a civil servant and one is law enforcement, one is coming with probable cause to make an arrest, one is coming with not, um, is one area. But the other thing is that the impact that it's having is so vastly different. I mean, we do not see NYPD coming in mm -hmm. either at the numbers that we're seeing, the frequency with which we're seeing it with ICE, number one, and number two, the impact on the number of people. And you know what we're seeing in terms of the delaying of arraignments, the drain, delaying of court process, the shutting down of court parts where people don't have access, ingress or egress out of the court system while that's taking place, the fear, the people, the warranting from court because people can't access it, all the circumstances around it differentiate this situation from law enforcement. And Councilman, um, we have looked at that question and there are absolutely rules that OCA can promulgate that would not be discriminatory in the way that you're referencing and that would be legally, that would be um, lawfully promulgated and legally defensible if challenged. i sorry, I lost the last sentence. That would be what? Um, that can be lawfully promulgated and yeah. would be legally defensible if challenged. Oh, you're okay. Are you going to share them with us? Pardon me? Are you going to share them with us? or? Well, I think that a lot of the suggestions that we, that all of the suggestions okay. that you've heard here today um, are, are non-discriminatory under the theory that you're suggesting that they might be. Um, you know, they can be, the policies that, um, we, that we have written, that others have written, um, they are worded and thought through in particularly careful ways so that they are not discriminatory against one law enforcement agency or one agency versus any other. Um, and we're confident that those rules would that those rules would be defended. Got it. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I again want to thank you all for not only your testimony but the suggestions before us today. My questions, I'm going to go and and really kind of better understand what we're going to be able to do to continue to explore how we're going to push. Um, I also want to say that I know that. In my in my remarks, that that I I, I want to clearly state that while the memorandum has become public since its April date, that this is not a place where we celebrate. This is a place where we mark, and we keep moving forward. And so I just want you to know that I am I am I am with you on that on that front. The better the better sense of of of, of these questions for me are really relating to exactly what's happening on the ground. So I have a, I have a couple questions to clarify. We talked about the hallways. We talked about the courtrooms. Is there a place where ICE usually conducts its arrests right now? Is there a place that is a a a priority for ICE that you can tell us? Is there a pattern? about where they are doing their arrests? So in terms of physical location, um, what it mostly happens, um, and again, this does require them to alert the court officers who conduct sort of the patrol of the hallways to allow people in and out of courtrooms. Most courtrooms have an exterior hallway door and an interior door to the courtroom, which creates a vestibule in between the two doors. And almost every courtroom has that. It's for sound buffering uh, and other sort of safety protocols, right? So what happens is ICE will come in, um, and when your client, if you're not told and you haven't, asked, haven't been forced to ask for bail on behalf of your client and your client leaves, they get trapped uh, between the two sets of doors. Without the lawyer. Mm. Um, without the lawyer Sometimes we can push our way in, but it's mostly without the lawyer. There's no other witnesses. And it is sometimes assisted by a court officer standing on the outside to prevent people from coming in from the general public who has to access that, or people leaving the courtroom. So in essence, you could have a few court officers and a few ICE agents now having this person in this vestibule with no benefit of counsel, no benefit of witnesses, and they're going to be cuffed. And that's normally the way it happens, um, with the exception of the times in which they have waited and followed somebody out and sort of arrested them, in the case in Queens, arrested three people right outside the courthouse. And I happen to believe that that took place in the way in which it did, because Beth Fertig from WNYC was there, had spoken to the officers, so they knew that she was there, so they weren't going to try to do it again to three other people, so they waited until the end. 
And the the place that you talk about this vestibule that's outside that's con that's disconnect that's outside the courthouse or outside the courtroom um, is a place that ha that ICE as a law enforcement officer can access with the court officers as well. That that is a well. A, go ahead. I mean, if you look at this chamber, yeah. Councilman, you have the exterior door, right? Then you have these interior doors. So what usually happens is that after the case is called, the client is now leaving the courtroom, the attorney is walking along, a court officer will usually stop the attorney and say, you have to wait here. The client will go through that first set of double doors and they will arrest him and trap him in that area. They will not let counsel uh, be present for that often. If I've had my attorneys ask, do you have a warrant, try to get information from ICE agents, and they just kind of ignore them and say, are you the attorney of record? And if you're not, they just whisk the person away. And is that a place, so just to understand the sense of public spaces, is that a public space? Is that a place, is that, is that a, a court, is that, a, is that part of the court space as well? No, it's, it's the way you enter and leave the courtroom. It's a, a public space. Everyone needs to walk through it, every member of the public, in order to access the courtroom, um, as well as, you know, attorneys come in and out all the time. Um, I, I would say that, that the vestibule becomes very sort of critical in cases where the enforcement agency needs to confirm the identity, as I was saying, where they're sort of waiting for the proceeding to, to end in order to take the person into custody. But we're also hearing reports of people being taken into custody before they're even able to see the judge. So the enforcement is haphazard. I, there isn't consistency, which is part of the trouble. Um, so we can't pinpoint or ascertain one place that is more dangerous or one court or one area. It is all over the place. It is people outside of court. It is people after appearing on their cases. It's people before appearing on their cases. Um, and I think that it just leads to a really important question. We can spend a lot of time, and we should spend a lot of time, probably more time than anyone in here has, thinking about, well, what can OCA do? What, where, you know, what are these agency relationships? But one thing we could also consider is just limiting the amount of exposure people have, limiting the amount of times people have to come into criminal court, um, right? Criminal court is plagued by delays, a lot of appearances in which nothing actually occurs on a case. This is something that happens in the Bronx from time to time. Um, it's been noted before, but right, so the, how disruptive this is to anyone, any criminal defendant's uh, life is one thing, but here, enhancing the vulnerability. So what can we do? Can we stop requiring people to come to court unless something is actually going to occur that they need to be present for? This is true in the diversion parts and in our traditional courts. So let's just follow that. How do we do that? We tell people they don't have to come unless we tell them to come. Who's we? the judge in, in collaboration with the prosecutors and defenders. So this is a collaborative process of determining return, a, and a, that's a negotiable, right, a, we can negotiate right. a that. Judge, a judge can excuse the appearance of someone. It, they have the discretion? We, right, they have the, they have the authority. They can excuse somebody from coming and saying, uh, you don't have to come, since it's only on the filing of motions or nothing will be happening where you will be making a decision speak to your counsel, but you have a, uh, I can excuse you for your next two or three appearances until there is something, in which case then we can have a conversation with our client as to whether that is in their best interest, and I will say, uh, given sort of what has been happening, uh, many of us would say, in fact, it would be in our best interest of our client in that moment. How, how far is that discretion? And I mean, I would just say, in fact, that is something that lawyers are trying to do, but without any, you know, imprint of acceptance by the chief judge, either locally or the chief judge of the state, there are judges that are reluctant to do that. So it is certainly within their discretion, but I think that they are looking for leadership from their chief judges to say whether or not that is acceptable. So sometimes we know that there is a client who is particularly vulnerable, and we will go in on that court date and ask that that person not be required to appear. And some judges say yes and some judges say no. But they feel very much like they are out on their own there without any leadership, without any support, and without any guidance for doing so. So this is back to chief, chief justice work and pushing for leadership in bold. So this is one, one of those places where we reduce the times through a negotiated understanding for clients who are vulnerable, specifically our immigrant and undocumented 
clients. Absolutely. And you can, you can start, start in the diversion courts where a lot of the appearances are for updates or, you know, for simply reporting on how the person is doing in terms of compliance. Um, and these are collaborative courts to begin with, and so there would be a structure in place in order to do that. And then think about how this can also apply throughout our more traditional courtrooms. Um, and, and I think that that would do a lot to protect folks from just having to appear repeatedly. Okay, so um, what happens in a situation where there is a criminal case that is ongoing and the, the defendant is arrested? What happens to that case? It's, that, if I may, that's an excellent question. And there are two problems with it. One, the criminal case ends up being in limbo, getting writ, ridded back into the criminal process so that you can appear on your criminal case is very difficult and very rarely happens. In fact, I don't think we have seen it happen once. So ultimately, what ends up happening is that the case lives in limbo for a period of time and eventually the case would have to get dismissed because there isn't any mechanism by which to bring that person back. The other there's thing, no mechanism or there's no power? So, so who would... I, I mean, there is a mechanism by which somebody could be brought to court from detention on their court dates, but it is not done. And what's preventing that from happening? Probably will, resources, priority, decision-making um, by the various parties. That's, I mean, that is, that's something that we have seen sort of at its core, whether or not there's any, you know, sort of written policy that governs that, that I'm not aware of. Um, but I would also note that what our um, advocates and lawyers who work uh, and doing immigration detention work will say is that not only is it problematic for that person's criminal case, right? They had been, they had pleaded not guilty, right? They were coming to court to fight their case, to get justice for themselves and are unable to do that, but it actually makes it harder for them to fight their deportation case in immigration court because they show up in immigration court with an open matter. If that had ultimately been adjudicated to its completion, it might have resulted in a dismissal. It might have resulted in an acquittal. It might have resulted in some other kind of favorable disposition. But where, where discretion can be applied in the deportation cases, whether that's in ultimate relief or in setting bond, um, that is a place where those same clients are now hurt doubly by the fact that that case left, was left unresolved. I'm now interested in understanding a little bit about the kind of criminal history that the individuals who are arrested by ICE are, um, uh, criminal histories in general that are being targeted by ICE. Is there rhyme or reason or patterns on who they're targeting? Are we talking about DUIs, drug offenses, misdemeanors, felonies? Tell, tell me a little bit more about, about that if there's any pattern. So I think every, uh, I think sort of the rhetoric uh, and what ICE has put out, what even some of uh, folks in the administrations, both city and state, sort of have said is th these are people who have uh, serious violent felony histories. Um, the reality of that, uh, our EAP client, um, the young man who actually, I think New York One broke a story recently about uh, uh, a young man being taken out of traffic court where his mother uh, was crying. Um, th these are not uh, so this is, uh, this is the story of, of every immigrant uh, because there is no rhyme or reason. The public safety rhetoric is fear-mongering. It is an excuse for ICE to act and perhaps an excuse for our inaction. It is not at all the reality of the situation. The surveys provided that IDP has been tracking uh, across, this across this state has said this, not to mention across the country. So um, they are people who uh, are asylum seekers and in the process of that could have derivative citizenship, um, could have been here because they are a victim and may have an adjustment based on that. They have no criminal histories. They may have some criminal histories. Uh, you, new, old, you name it. There is no rhyme or reason. Um, and uh, that in and of itself should be something that really motivates all of us to immediate action. And, and this is not for this discussion, but it's related. This is why knife up is just so important at the end of the day and getting, getting lawyers in front. Uh, uh, Tina, you mentioned something about suing. Like we should just do something and allow them to sue us. Give us some examples about what we can do and 
I want to kind of explore that concept. Look, like there it. is affirmative litig legal aid society. We do this. We do this a lot. Um, you know, you can take affirmative litigation, right? So, of course, we are all looking into affirmative litigation. We have NICLO at the table. IDP has been looking. We have law firms, pro bono law firms, that want to do something that see this as a grave injustice. So, there is affirmative litigation. But what I was also suggesting is. Perhaps sometimes you just have to defend the litigation. And that may be up to the city and the state to do through uh, our AG or our Corp Council, um, which is if in fact there are, and I, I believe IDP has done the research, so have we, that many of these policies that we're suggesting actually uh, the federal government might try to litigate, but I think that they are defensible. Um, and so sometimes you just have to do it right, that the, no matter what the analysis is, we're never going to know. And I'm going to sort of probably guess that given who we have at the federal government, uh, anything we do, they may try to stop us from doing. Even the most uh, sort of benign, perhaps even policies like this. So we have to be ready to defend and we cannot have inaction because we think we may get uh, stopped. So sometimes you just have to defend a litigation in, as well. I also wanted to add that, um, you know, as you've certainly identified, this is a really complicated and multi-dimensional problem, and it needs a complicated and multi-dimensional solution. I agree that affirmative litigation is something that all of the actors who Tina mentioned should be considering and preparing for, but this this problem also requires an intervention by OCA. It needs a set of rules from the chief judge. That is something that can happen now. It can happen quickly. It can be effective. And it is a f absolutely crucial first step in getting ICE out of the courts and restoring community sense of safety in coming to court. Got it. And and finally, I think there's, there's a, a real sense of uh, evolution of our courts. We are, we're in a time and place that we are being tested on so many different levels, this complicated nature of, the, of, of courts. And is there, is there, is there way, are there ways that we can, either through legislation, both the city or the state, to reduce the amount of visits that can incorporate things that our founding fathers didn't have back then, like technology, or teleconferencing, for example, can be an opportunity for us to inject, both in pilot forms or others, where we can say, okay, you won't be able, you, you're not gonna need to, to appear, but we'll, we can have, uh, we can have a, a, a Skype session so that you can be present, but not be physically present for, for, the, for, for the reason that we're here today. Are those examples of the let's do it and see what happens? And this is an idea that I think uh, some folks have been talking to me about, where we can begin to inject in New York State, where we're seeing some movement, not, we're not happy with it, some movement in exploring the evolution of how our courts work and, and how we can continue to protect not just our clients uh, and New Yorkers, but the actual institution itself. How does that work? So there are many, many that? sort of reform efforts that actually the city and state can do. And I think we touched on some of them, but sort of to put them in sort of a one pager, so to speak, right? So Kate talked about, so what could we do at the city level? Well, look, if we, uh, uh, the more people we arrest, the more people we put through the criminal justice system that are immigrants or from communities of color, the more likely, right, we have this devaluing of justice, this unfairness, and now this consequence. So let's look at that. We can do that as a city, right? As a state, uh, speedy trial reform, um, which was almost close to passing and then did not, uh, is something that uh, fundamentally is a principle by which we should be guided in the criminal courts that we shouldn't have due process and the right to trial take years or have multiple adjournments. So that's something we can do. And that is something we can control right now. Um, if, we, if we want to see a systemic shift uh, in making our courts more just, we can't, there are things separate and apart of the chief judge immediately issuing rules um, that we can do to make the system fairer 
and more leaner so that less people are being arrested and prosecuted, particularly immigrants and people of color, that also then make the process, the efficiency of the court work better, speedy trial, discovery, uh, all of those things, I think, have to be looked at from the lens now of creating a real sanctuary. And, and part of that, Councilman, is just cultural. So if you ever practiced in federal court, you know, you do not go into a federal judge's courtroom unless there is something that's going to happen on the case. If you're just going to go in and report to a federal judge, we need more time. You know, he or she's going to look at you and say, why are you wasting my time? You could have sent a letter. You could have called my clerk and said, we're just going to roll this case over. So I think, you know, Kate has certainly addressed this. If we're in a diversion court and we know it's just on for an update, and the client has gone to therapy and they're doing great and all we're going to do is adjourn the case for 30 days, why are we dragging that person all the way to court to maybe miss work, to have you know, home care issues, to maybe miss school, all these things. Or confront us. And that's just culture. Right. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Those are all my, all my questions for now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, let me mention that we've been joined by Council Member Ben Kalos and I know that Council Member Danny Drum has questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Lansman. Uh, some of you may know that I wrote a letter to uh, Honorable Lawrence K. Marks, the Chief Administrative Judge, on this issue uh, on April 26, 2017, and got a less than satisfactory, in my opinion, <laughs> uh, letter from uh, Judge Marks um, dated May 10th. By the way, it's interesting that my letter to Judge Marks is dated the same day as the memo is dated. So I was just wondering if that was coincidental, but I don't know. And I think the chair might have mentioned that in his um, opening statement as well. But in the letter that I received from Judge Marks, he does say that as a result of some discussions that he had been having with advocates as well, that protocols were being instituted and officers have been now um, directed to prepare a written report whenever ICE enters the state courthouse with the intent to take a person into custody. Do we know what those reports look like or how many of them there are or how often they're being filed or, or just a general idea of what's going on with those reports? So the report that I think he's referring to uh, is mentioned in here, which is when there's an unusual occurrence. So this wasn't something that OCA put in process. Uh, as a result of ICE, they, they've had these unusual reports. Uh, two people get into a fight in the vestibule. Court officers have to f sort of f fill out this report so that OCA understands what's happening. Um, I will well, tell you. Sorry, let me just yes. interrupt because I, I, you know, I have the letter that was written to, yeah. to Danny, and it says, uh, we have directed our court officers to prepare a written report whenever ICE enters a state courthouse with the intent to take a person into custody. That is broader and, and, and more usual than what is spelled out in the, in the right. policy, which, as you're referring to, you know, is only unusual occurrences. So, right. you know, we and should figure out... So like, I will tell you that here's... The first problem with that is the report happens after the fact. Damage done, right? Person gone, no notice. Lawyers may not know. I will also say that as Stan mentioned in his initial remarks, each and every one of us, have a, we have an email list that every single time one of our attorneys or managers uh, sees something going on as to an ICE agent in a courthouse, we alert each other and the chief clerk is on that email. And I will tell you that I've been a little uh, sort of concerned that his answer sometimes is, we weren't, we'll look into it, we haven't been notified of that one. So the state court system is huge. There is enormous amount of staff to think that OCA in real time, OCA leadership in real time is going to get this um, and again, it is something that's filed after the fact. It was an occurrence that already happened. Um, doesn't really do much to actually help protect the person or the sanctity of the process. So I think in that protocol, if I'm not mistaken as well, it says that um, um, law enforcement agencies who enter a New York State courthouse to take a person into custody but do not have a warrant 
issued by a judge of the unified court system authorizing them to do so, and then it lists the procedures. Uh, how often do um, law enforcement agents enter a courthouse that don't have a warrant? All the time. All the time. It happens all the time. So all the they time. would have an NYPD. NYPD officer. will routinely come in unless they have an arrest warrant because somebody warranted from another court proceeding or an arrest warrant because they have already uh, vetted this with a judge for probable cause. Um, uh, it would happen all the time. And certainly the ICE agents uh, are acting in almost all instances with, in fact, the civil detainer. And, and Councilman, if I could. I mean, if you look at the first bullet point, upon entry to a courthouse, law enforcement officials covered by this protocol shall identify themselves um, and tell the unified court system employee why they're there and what their purpose is. You can go to 100 Center Street right up the street right now. If you have a badge, you flash it, you walk in. There's nobody stopping you. There's nobody saying where you're going. There's nobody saying who are you here to arrest. So there is a disconnect between what is on this memo and what actually happens every day in the courthouses. Well, I kind of personally know that a little bit too because council members uh, previously, I have one, were issued badges and whenever I use my badge, I can pretty much go anywhere I want no? uh, with that badge. Exhibit A for my point. Right. <laughs> um, so that's true, but I also had an experience at uh, 26 Federal Plaza where it was a little bit different actually. And then the argument has been made, I'm not sure who made it on the panel, that courthouses um, and or federal buildings, which are supposed to be public places, and I think there may have been previous uh, law determining that anybody is supposed to be allowed to enter, but before I, was en before I was allowed to enter, I had to state where I was going and for what purpose I was going, and I think the intent of that was to prevent me from actually getting into the building. Uh, and then even when I got into the building, uh, we were there for a specific case for somebody who was possibly going to face uh, deportation. Uh, we were not allowed to gather in the hallways or to talk. And I also happened to be with the Speaker of the New York City Council. And we were told we were not, even after identifying ourselves, they told us in, in no uncertain terms, cursing at us actually, to get the F out of the hallway yeah. and, um, and trying to move us out of the building. Um, so the argument that uh, courthouses and federal buildings are as well are public places doesn't really hold true from, from my experience, and from the, I would say from the speakers as well. And Councilman Jones, they go one step further. If you are a law enforcement official going into a federal building and you are armed, you must and they take your sidearm away. Whether you're FBI, NYPD, ICE, no one is allowed in a federal courthouse with a firearm except the marshal service who are given the responsibility for security for that courthouse. And OCA could do the same exact thing with anybody entering their courthouses, and should. So, and the director of ICE for New York City himself tried to throw us out of, out of the federal courthouse building that day. So I, I don't buy that argument at all. But anyway, let me, let me go on. I, I, I just have some other questions, because I heard some um, disturbing statistics, um, and that is in the issue of prostitution. Um, and I'm wondering why we have seen such an increase in the number of prostitution cases. Uh, I, for one, I have a state senator, Jose Peralta, actually, who's been pushing for increased enforcement along Roosevelt Avenue. He calls it cleaning up Roosevelt Avenue. And I'm wondering if um, the uh, number of arrests don't um, coincide with uh, the push by some electeds for increased enforcement of prostitution cases. Uh, that may have something to do with it, sure. I mean, we see arrest uh, patterns as really cyclical and responsive to a lot of different factors, but one thing that, that is very concerning is that actual arrests under the penal law section for prostitution and loitering for prostitution are pretty much down across the city and across the state, which is a trend that we want to see continue for a lot of reasons. We understand these arrests to be harmful um, for individuals in the commercial sex industry under whatever circumstance, but it's the massage parlor enforcement where we're seeing the huge spike, huge. Um, and this, is, this was a law, it's the education law, that deals with the license to practice a profession. And in 2012, we, we had something like 30 arrests across the city under this statute. Went up to 631 last year. Um, so it's a huge increase. And what is driving that? I don't know. I think that there's a, there was a reorganization in vice, in the vice units that dealt with narcotics and vice that 
may have shifted priorities. Um, we see teams doing these arrests now that we didn't see before. I would point out also that the New York City Police Department had a press conference on February 1st where it said it was not going to focus enforcement on people engaging in commercial sex anymore, that it was not going to make prostitution arrests. Our experience since February 1st has been quite the opposite. As a matter of fact, in the, in the first few days after that announcement, we saw a spike in arrests in hotels across the city. Um, so the enforcement here is troubling, but I would really love to get at the answer to that question, which is why the massage parlor enforcement right now, what's coming of it, I hope we are not doing it in the name of combating human trafficking because there's nothing flowing from that that actually does anything about human trafficking. That could be a whole nother hearing, I suppose, but, mm -hmm. but it's troubling and I would love to get to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. And can you describe for us also what a prostitution charge means in terms of immigration uh, applications and how damaging that is to a case? Yes, um, and there are a lot of people in this room who I think are hoping to testify also who can get into that in much more detail. I'm a lot of the specific immigration practitioners, but prostitution is one of the oldest immigration exclusions. Um, involvement in any prostitution activity, admission of involvement in any prostitution activity or conviction, um, finding of guilt on any prostitution activity can cause a bar for obtaining relief, um, adjusting status, et cetera. And the stat that you gave us was that 91% of the arrestees are, are undocumented or they were, was that That's black in mas for massage parlor enforcement. 91% mm -hmm. are foreign, foreign nationals, 37% are undocumented. 37%, okay. But of our clients, of our 1,400 or so clients arrested on prostitution offenses in a one year period, um, approximately 14% of that 1,400 are undocumented. And that's for prostitution, massage parlor enforcement, all the related offenses. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. I was uh, happy to get a parking placard. Now I know I can get a badge. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. Council members and badges. What could go wrong? Um, Barry? Good. Thank you. Uh, on, right? Okay, now I'm on. I'll say thank you again, just, just for the record. Um, anybody on the panel? Do we find that uh, the people from ICE are congregating in any specific courthouses in more than others? Are we more likely to find them in criminal court than family court or civil court or? Just curious. Are they in Queens more than they are in yep. Staten Island or, you know? Well, they're, certain, uh, they're certainly conducting more arrests in the criminal courts than in the family courts, but um, Part of the disturbing trend of the Trump administration has been um, increased presence in family courts. Um, and we've seen that more and more um, as Trump's ICE has continued with its, with its operations. Um, we have, in surveying um, advocates statewide, we've seen more of a concentration of arrests inside New York City, but still a significant number in upstate counties as well. So they're pretty much all over, the, they're getting to be all over the place. Yes. And. Uh, I'm not. I, I'm not as aware of this as I should be, but they're hiring. I assume ICE is hiring more uh, employees. That's what I can call them. I don't know what. I guess that's what they are. They are, and certainly trying to. By executive order, President Trump called on uh, called for the hire of 10,000 additional ICE agents, which is almost tripling its enforcement capacity. And to your knowledge, or to anybody's knowledge here, are we seeing this more in in New York City? Let's just. Ground zero for immigration. Uh, we have some of the most diverse places on earth here. Are we seeing this more than, say, you would see it in, you know, middle America, like Columbus, Ohio, or Omaha, or something like that? Do you know the statistics being kept? Well, are they, what I mean to say really is, are they targeting our fair city as opposed to somewhere else? I don't think you have to go to Columbus and Ohio to make the distinction. So. You know, we are all part of, or most of us are part of the Chief Defenders Association of New York. And I was on a board call last week, and I asked my upstate brethren whether they were seeing, you know, the same kind of ice presence in their courtrooms that we were seeing in New York City, and they were not. Okay. Um, so it seems to be much more concentrated in the city than the rest of the state. Thank you. Oh, I just wanted to make one uh, comment about where we're seeing ice in terms of what types of courthouses. 
Um, you know, one of the concerns that we have is that there's a, an impression out there that they're targeting the criminal courthouses because those are like worse immigrants, right? And that is far from the truth. There is no distinction to be made between criminal court and other courts except the ease of access to information about court names and court dates. Um, that is really the distinction that we are seeing in terms of why people who have pending cases in criminal court are being targeted more than other courthouses, is that it's easier to access that information. And in fact, before I testified, I did a cursory review of all the emails that had been referenced that came through our listserv about ICE agents in the Bronx criminal courthouse, and every single one of them were, took place in the upfront misdemeanor parts, non-domestic violence. So these are people who are currently in court on low-level, non-violent misdemeanor cases, and those are the people that are being targeted. So it's not like we're seeing people being targeted because they're being charged with violent felony offenses currently, and that's now triggering an examination of their prior immigration history or prior criminal history. In fact, some of the irony here is that people who are charged with violent felony offenses are more likely to be incarcerated and therefore get the protections of the detainer law, <laughs> and people who are currently There's being charged with the trespass and marijuana case and a turnstile jump are the ones that we are not able to protect. The last question um, for anybody on the panel. You know, my name's Gradenchik. I get arrested. Everybody's going to know about it because there aren't that many of us. But many, of, many people have very common names, whether it's Jones or Johnson or whatever have you. Have you had problems where people are being sought out by ICE and they're the wrong person um, simply because they have such common names? So one of the problems, and I, I alluded to it uh, um, in my statements, is um, the way in which when you're fingerprinted and your information is fed into the federal system, it reports back something that's not always based on your fingerprints, but on matching of information, name, social security numbers. Um, we used to, as public defenders, get a report on the back of a rap sheet or a criminal history called the NCIC. And when we used to vet that information with our clients, most often they would say, that's not me, that, as, that social security number is one digit off, that's not how I spell my last name, that's not my birthday. But it links to, uh, however the matching happens, it would be linked to this person. A real sort of problem for us is that DCJS, the state, uh, has agreed with uh, the federal government to now no longer give defense counsel the NCIC. So we can't actually verify and vet whether or not the person who might, it might show that they're wanted for immigration um, is in fact the person. In the case in the Bronx where our lawyer to save our client from being put into, taken by, from ICE, asked for bail, and bail was set. Uh, after several weeks of looking into that issue, um, we realized, they realized that the information that ICE had was wrong. So that seems that that's something that we, that's a concrete step we could take uh, to ask the state to make sure that people are being, you know, at the very least identified properly. We certainly don't want anybody to be in trouble because they got the wrong name or the wrong identity. We have sent a, a demand letter to DCJ ask, asking for a meeting to change this policy. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. I have one last question. And as you know, the city is trying to do everything we can to figure out how to limit ICE, not just from the detainer laws, but on our schools, they're on public city-owned property. What can we be asking the state to do under this larger question about ICE in our courthouses? What can we be pushing the governor and the state legislators to do to join us in this effort? Well, one suggestion is that with respect to the rules that we have been suggesting over and over again um, during, in the course of this conversation, the legislature and the judiciary, they share authority to promulgate rules um, that, would, that bind the court system. Um, we have chosen to engage in this advocacy with the judge herself because we think that would be, that would be effective, but an alternative would be for the legislature to pass a law. Um, 
that would direct the judge to promulgate the rules that we've suggested. Um, and that kind of action would also come in, uh, could come through cooperation and collaboration with the governor. Um, I think the governor's been extraordinarily supportive of the rights of immigrants in New York, particularly since President Trump was elected. Um, and so we would welcome any leadership he would take on this particular issue. So essentially legalize everything we're trying to do here and waiting for the judge to show leadership, just pass a law says, and then insert everything we've been talking about. Great. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Um, we have our next panel. Uh, Terry Lawson from Bronx Legal Services. Um, Carmen Ray from Sanctuary for Families. Hamar Ahmad from Her Justice. Alejandro Caraballo from New York Legal Assistance Group. Sarah Nolan also from New York Legal Assistance Group. Good afternoon. If you would all raise your right hand so we can get sworn in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Who would like to lead off? Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you for this opportunity to testify regarding ICE enforcement in New York Unified Court System. My name is Terry Lawson. I am the director of the Family and Immigration Unit of Bronx Legal Services, which is the Bronx Office of Legal Services NYC. I also co-lead the Bronx Immigration Partnership, which is a network of legal and social services providers for, to provide a coordinated safety net of services for Bronx immigrants. Last month, we hosted our first emergency preparedness workshop to prepare Bronx families in the event of deportation. The majority of people who came to the workshop were Spanish-speaking immigrants, and most had been affected by intimate partner and family violence. As people were leaving the workshops, we asked them to complete a survey in which we asked them, how do you feel about ICE working with court officials? These were, what, these were the answers they provided. I won't be safe in case I need to go to court. I should be able to go to court without having to be scared of getting arrested or deported. As an immigrant, we have rights and should be safe trying to get help for our kids. Que los derechos de los inmigrantes no sean escuchados that the rights of immigrants are not heard. Que haya arrestos en los cortes, that there are arrests in the courts. Si, sí, tengo mucho preocupación. Yes, I am very worried. These sentiments make clear that immigrants do not feel safe anywhere. NYC court officials have stated that there is little they can do to change the national anti-immigrant rhetoric this may be true, but to do nothing to stop ICE from commandeering the New York courts and its resources is to signal that not everyone is entitled to access to justice and allows the rhetoric of fear to oppress people's due process rights. When pushed to do more, court officials and others have said that ICE is only arresting sexual predators and serious felons repeating a false narrative fed to them by ICE that purports to protect survivors while actually endangering them. If our clients must make the choice between deportation, even the risk of deportation, and going to court for child support, custody, 
orders of protection, or to seek redress against their landlords. It should be obvious to everyone, including OCA, that clients will choose to remain with their families than risk deportation. A colleague asked me recently whether someone has to die for us to have court rules that prevent ICE from working with court officials. But we must refuse the temptation to sensationalize tragedy to convince the courts to protect litigants. What happened last week at Queen's Trafficking Court was shocking and provided us with an important foothold in our argument that ICE is arresting more than sexual predators. But OCA must act to prohibit its personnel from collaborating with, collaborating with ICE in all cases, not just to protect the weakest among us, but because our courts cannot function with ICE patrolling the hallways, working with court officers, clerks, and judges to zero in on unsuspecting litigants. The courts must remain a place where people can go to exercise their rights under New York law and not be easy targets for a federal immigration enforcement agency that takes advantage of the hard-won resources of our New York courts. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Carmen Maria Rey, and I'm Deputy Director of the Immigration Intervention Project at Sanctuary for Families. Uh, we're one of New York City's leading providers of legal, clinical, housing, and employment services for survivors of human trafficking, domestic violence, and other forms of gender-related violence. We are, of course, grateful to you today for the opportunity to testify. Um, I'd like to first just say that we second everything stated by the Criminal Defenders and the Immigrant Defense Project, um, and just to uh, further comment on the question of where we're seeing arrests, I second that we're certainly seeing more arrests in the criminal courts, but I would posit that the effects of those arrests are actually rippling much more through the other courts in New York City, because suddenly what we are seeing in our cases is that the threat of calling ICE by the other litigant in the case is now something that our clients have to take into uh, account when trying to make legal decisions about how to proceed on their cases. The presence of ICE in New York's courtrooms deeply, of course, concerns us. It has unquestionably created a chilling effect on victims of domestic violence and trafficking seeking to exercise their legal rights in New York's courts. As the council member noted, a recent survey convict, um, sorry, conducted by the Immigrant Defense Project, found that of 225 attorneys and advocates that responded to the survey, three quarters of them reported having worked with immigrants who expressed fear of the courts because of ICE's presence there, and nearly half reported having worked with immigrants who failed to file a petition, who withdrew a petition um, with, because they were afraid of encountering ICE in the court. But most concerning for those of us who are directly working with survivors of domestic violence and trafficking, nearly 70% of survey respondents working with survivors reported having had clients who decided to not seek help at all from the courts because they feared encountering ICE. This is not something that the council doesn't know. I've testified about it before. But um, the survey results are extremely troubling. Abusers and traffickers share one common trait. They exercise power and control as an instrument of abuse, attacking their victims where they are most vulnerable to keep them under their control. Abusers and traffickers routinely threaten immigrant victims with deportation and permanent separation from their U.S.-born children and other family in the U.S. as a tool to prevent them from calling authorities and ending the abuse. For decades, organizations like Sanctuary have worked tirelessly to gain the trust of immigrant victims and to assure them that if they come forward to report the crimes committed against them, we can keep them safe from their abusers and their traffickers, that ICE will not be able to just find them and take them away, and that, most importantly, they will be safe with our law enforcement officers and with our judges in our courts. That trust that we worked for decades to develop has been severely damaged since January of this year. Routinely now, the news report incidents of ICE arresting litigants in our courts, even attempting the arrest of a survivor of human trafficking in the Queen's trafficking part two weeks ago. This lends credence to the threats victims have heard for years, sometimes decades, from their abusers and traffickers. 
Over the past several months, our immigrant clients have been particularly apprehensive about going to family court to seek orders of protection, of custody, and of child support. They've even expressed concern about protecting their property rights in divorces. If I make my husband mad, he'll call ICE to come and get me in the courtroom. Of the hundreds of our clients that have been too afraid to proceed with litigation in the courts, one of the most heartbreaking stories is that of one of my longtime clients, and I apologize if I get emotional about this. This feels very personal to me. Maria is uh, too afraid to seek an order of protection, uh, I'm sorry, uh, of custody and visitation in family court against her daughter's father, a man who beat her brutally for over a decade and who recently kidnapped their daughter, who I held in my arms when she was born. Maria's abuser knows that she entered the country unlawfully and that in 1998, at the age of 17, she was convicted of a minor drug-related crime. This means that, despite having lived in the United States for nearly 30 years and having a young U.S. citizen daughter, Maria is a priority for deportation. Her abuser knows this and has threatened her that if she tries to get her daughter back, he'll call immigration and have her deported. He doesn't know where she lives because we've made the sanctuary has kind of enveloped her own services and put her in shelter. But he knows that if she files for custody, he can tell ICE where she'll be on the date of her court hearing, and they'll come to arrest her. She's a priority. M Maria is now too afraid to seek the one legal remedy that would be available to her, suing for custody and visitation over her daughter in family court because she's too afraid to come forward to the attention of immigration authorities and be deported from the U.S. and never see her daughter again. As her advocates, as the situation currently stands, we cannot assure her of her safety in our courts. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank the City Council and the Committee on Immigration and the Courts for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Hamra Ahmed. I'm the Director of Legal Services at Her Justice. We are a nonprofit organization that uh, takes a pro bono first approach to provide free legal services to women living in poverty throughout New York City. We train and mentor volunteer lawyers who enable our clients to access the legal system and obtain the justice they deserve. Our clients come from all five boroughs in New York City. Half are Latina, a quarter are African American, and 16% are Asian or from another minority group. Approximately 80% of our clients are domestic violence survivors, and three quarters of our clients are mothers. Our staff of 18 lawyers and legal support staff ensures that over 3,000 women every year receive legal assistance in family, divorce, and immigration matters. The majority of our cases, 80%, are handled by our volunteer lawyers from the city's premier law firms with rich assessment, mentoring, training, and support from our staff. The remaining 20% of the cases are handled in-house to ensure that we retain the ne necessary flexibility to respond to emergency situations, navigate particularly complex legal issues, and stay fully engaged in the matters on which we train and provide support. As you are well aware, recent activity of immigration and customs enforcement in the family and trafficking courts, as well as the current reality of charged language and changing federal policy, has created a dreadful climate of fear among families who have foreign-born members. As 70% of our clients were born abroad, we have been working to address these fears with even more focus and dedication than before. We are working hard to ensure that civil court is a safe place for our clients to access, to access remedies crucial to their and their families' well-being. Immigrants are hesitant to seek custody of their children financial support to raise their children or to assert their rights to a fair share of any assets accumulated in the marriage in a Supreme Court divorce litigation. Immigrant victims of domestic violence are more afraid than ever to call law enforcement, to access the courts, or to even contact a lawyer for advice. This may be the first time that they come into contact with the legal system to directly address the violence they have suffered by participating in the criminal justice system, as a witness or seeking a civil court order of protection. The volunteer lawyers that we train and mentor are also concerned for their clients. Before, attorneys would encourage their clients to seek help in the courts, no matter what their immigration status. We have had to shift our advice to volunteer attorneys who are now taking calcul calculated risks counseling their clients to seek relief in the courts. We conduct special trainings with our partners to help them counsel clients in this new climate of uncertainty. Here are two recent examples of what our clients are experiencing. 
At the Bronx Family Justice Center, a client came seeking a divorce from her husband and orders of paternity and child support from an abusive former partner. Following the consultation, the client decided not to file for paternity and child support, not, not file those petitions, because she fears that family court litigation will lead to her former partner's deportation. The client cited recent reports to ICE officials near and in courthouses. Her former partner told her not to file because he didn't have legal status and doesn't want to be in the court system. Without those paternity and child support orders, the client's divorce against her husband will likely require hearing on notice to the abusive partner, which could put the client in danger because of the history of abuse. Another case, a client with a pending application for U non-immigrant status came home and found a notice from the New York City Sheriff's Office stating that service was attempted and requesting that the client contact the Sheriff's Office. The client, who was 34 weeks pregnant at the time, became so panicked that the notice uh, concerned her immigration status that she went into early labor and gave birth to the baby. The sheriff's notice concerned service of a visitation petition that the, abusive, uh, uh, baby's, the baby's abusive father had filed in family court. The presence of ICE in the courts has a chilling and rippling effect on the most vulnerable of our clients. Many of our foreign-born clients are scared to go to court the courts stand for the rule of law and have historically served as a safe place for where, where rights are protected. We want to work with the court system to develop protocols and rules that will make the courts a safer place for survivors and their family members. We ask that the court employees not assist or cooperate federal law enforcement activities in the course of their employment in any courthouse of the unified court system, including providing information to immigration enforcement officers regarding persons appearing before their court. The fear of ICE impacts all clients, domestic violence victims and non-victims. We are gravely concerned about all the impacts that are not always measurable and not seen on immigrants and their families. Thank you. Thank you. Chairs Lanson and Menchaca, council members and staff, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak to the courts and legal services and immigration committees regarding the impact of new immigration enforcement and tactics on access to justice. My name is Sarah Nolan and I'm a supervising attorney in the Legal Health Division of the New York Legal Assistance Group, also known as NILAG, and I'm joined here by my colleague Alejandra Caraballo from the LGBTQ Law Project. NILAG is a nonprofit law office dedicated to providing free legal services in civil law matters to low-income New Yorkers. NILAG serves a wide range of individuals, including immigrants, seniors, low-income members of the LGBTQ community, the homebound, families facing foreclosure, low-income consumers, children in need of special education, domestic violence victims, persons with disabilities, patients with chronic illness or disease, low-wage workers, Holocaust survivors, veterans, as well as many others in need of free legal services. Because of the variety of work that we do, we have a perspective on the wide-ranging effects of ICE's increased presence in courtrooms. We'd like to share with you today just a few example, concrete examples of how that's played out for us. Um, the recent report of ICE's presence in the human trafficking intervention court that we've been talking about this afternoon has caused panic among many of our immigrant clients who are victims of domestic violence, as we just heard. Um, likewise, uh, many of these clients have already asked to withdraw criminal cases against abusers because they are afraid that ICE will arrest them when they go to testify about this abuse in court. Other clients have told NILAG that they do not want to file cases at all in family court or file for immigration relief or even public benefits for fear that it will lead to detention and deportation. The palpable fear of ICE's presence in courtrooms also has a very real impact on our clients' willingness and desire to move forward with their immigration cases. For example, NILAG re represents a couple in a pending case for asylum. Our client was driving his brother's car to work, unaware that the vehicle's registration had been expired. He was pulled over and issued a summons. Our client called us extremely concerned about appearing in court to resolve his case because of the report that we're, of ICE's presence in courtrooms. He was so afraid of being detained, he seriously considered not going to court at all and would have thereby potentially jeopardized his very strong claim for asylum. Another client, a veteran of the US military, delayed going to court to obtain a disposition on a very minor traffic violation for months due to her fear of immigration enforcement, which delayed her application for, for citizenship. 
This fear of enforcement in courtrooms is having a very real chilling effect on our ability to assist our clients in obtaining legal immigration status or citizenship. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Alejandra Caraballo, to discuss the impact of ICE's presence in New York City courts has had on our transgender clients. Hi, my name is Alejandra Caraballo. I work uh, as a legal fellow in the LGBTQ Law Project at the New York Legal Assistance Group. Um, and I wanted to speak particularly about the effect that this has had on our uh, transgender, gender nonconforming, and LGBTQI um, clients. Um, New York City's transgender community has been disproportionately affected by threats of ICE in courts, particularly the trans-Latina community. NILAG's transgender clients, many of whom are served through its LGBTQ law project, are understandably terrified of ending up in detention. The only detention facility designated for transgender persons in the country is in California. All other transgender persons are put into detention with the general population, and according to Human Rights Watch, transgender women held in ICE detention facilities are often subjected to violence, sexual assault, and harassment because of their gender identity. Transgender women are often held in men's facilities, which creates an exceptionally high risk of sexual assault, trauma, and abuse. ICE resorts to the extended and unreasonable use of solitary confinement of transgender women because authorities cannot and will not devise a, any safe and humane way to keep transgender women in detention. Worse than the conditions in the ICE detention centers, many transgender individuals face deportation back to countries where they face violence, harassment, rape, and sexual assault. They often fled to the United States in the first place due to horrendous conditions in the, they faced in their home countries. Knowing this risk, NILAC's immigrant transgender clients are doing what they can to reduce the risk of detention, including not showing up in court or filing for protections that would require court appearances. For example, we represented two transgender clients on their name change petitions, which would have made them safer through ensuring that their documents match their gender identities and would have reduced the chance that they would have received harassment based on their gender identity. Um, we conducted screenings and consultations and drafted these name change petitions. Um, and a prior to filing in civil court, the clients called and said that they did not want to file because they were so scared and fearful of ICE presence in the courts. So they continue to this day without identity documents that ma match their gender identity. Um, the chilling effect that the presence of ICE is having in New York City courts is truly dangerous to this population that is already vulnerable. For them, the, tr the situation is truly life or death. While we were pleased with the Chief Judge Janet DeFore's statement following the arrest in the Human Trafficking Intervention Court requesting that ICE treat courthouses as sensitive locations similar to hospitals, schools, and places of worship, we believe that further steps must be taken to prevent immigration enforcement inside of New York City's courts. We support the proposal that the Office of Court Administration issue a directive that judicial warrants are required for civil arrests in courthouses unrelated to the proceeding at hand. This will ensure that ICE is executing targeted enforcement rather than raiding courthouses to round up as many immigrants as possible. Further, the Office of Court Administration must train its employees, including judges and court officers, on interactions with ICE. We believe that all unified court system employees should be directed not to cooperate with ICE or provide any information that not legally required to federal enforcement agents, including pointing out specific individuals when ICE cannot identify them. We urge the council to advocate with the Office of Court Administration to put these two rules in place to help protect immigrants in courts. I want to thank Chairs Lankman and Menchaka and the committees for holding this important hearing and shining a much needed light, uh, light on the issues of ICE in New York City courts and particularly the effect that it has on the transgender immigrant community. Thank you all very much, um, obviously, for what you do, but also for, for your testimony. It's very, very important that people understand that this is not just an issue in our criminal courts, um, but affects legal proceedings and, and um, other uh, things that are connected uh, to our judicial system in, in, in every courthouse. Um, do you have uh, questions, Council Member? No, just a, a thank you as well for, for being here, for bringing those voices. Uh, the continued connection to those voices is what's going to push this forward. I'd, 
And, and I know how hard it is to carry these cases with you, um, both through your personal connection to them and your commitment to them. Um, but these are, these, are, these are things that are gonna be able to melt um, the, the, the difficulty that right now we're experiencing. So just thank you for your courage uh, and your commitment to this, and, and we're with you. Thank you. And, and let me just add, um, specific ideas, we're taking notes, but specific ideas that you would like to see um, uh, OCA implement, in, in addition to completely boring eyes for many of the courthouses in, in New York State, New York City, um, please uh, share them with Rachel Kagan. Like I said, we're taking notes, but I want to make sure that nothing get lost, gets lost in the cracks. We, I think we're all part of the same kind of working groups that have all been thinking about it. And so the defenders were able to, to elucidate those, those ideas, um, but I think we're all in agreement that that's what we have to offer. Got it. Thank you very much. Our next panel is um, Nyasa Hickey from Brooklyn Defender Services, Perla Lopez from Make the Road, Yvonne Chen from Sanctuary for Families, Alan Keller, Dr. Alan Keller, Keller um, from Health and Human Rights, Bellevue Program for Survivors, and uh, Theo Liebman, the Hofstra University Law Clinic. Come on down. I hate to do this to you. I know that we told people five minutes. If you could do three minutes, that would be great. If you feel that you can't, that's okay too. But we have two more panels, I think, and um, yeah. So let's all raise our right hands. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Terrific. Who would like to go first? Is that on? Okay. Um, I'm Theo Liebman. Um, I work at uh, the Hostra Law Clinic in Hempstead, Long Island, and um, I run a legal clinic there. For the past 18 years, I've directed this clinic. Uh, we advocate for immigrant children who are escaping violence, poverty, and neglect. We, we have worked on behalf of Haitian children who've been orphaned uh, after the devastating 2010 earthquake. LGBTQ youth who are escaping in countries where their sexuality is a crime. Um, and we've represented countless survivors of physical and sexual abuse. We advocate for our young clients in New York City and Long Island's family courts, appellate courts, and federal immigration courts to achieve two overarching goals, promoting our clients' safety, stability, and permanency by establishing formal legal guardianship arrangements between them and their primary caretakers. That, of course, happens in the city family courts and by pursuing special immigrant juvenile status and lawful permanent residence to ensure that our clients don't have to return to countries where they've endured violence, abject poverty, and other traumatic experiences. Um, guardianship proceedings and key elements of the special immigrant juvenile process require our young clients and their families to initiate matters in the state family court, to attend court appearances and hearings in family courts, and to provide extensive personal information to family court judges and administrators. In the 21 years that I've worked in New York's family courts, including the city family courts as well as Long Island, I had never, ever seen or heard of a single instance of ICE enforcement or presence in family court buildings, nor ICE involvement in any aspect of family court proceedings. That changed in November of 2016. Recent activities of ICE and family courts that have been reported and confirmed by the Immigrant Defense Project and others include the following. On November 22nd, ICE agents arrested a mother who
who appeared in Albany Family Court for a PINS petition that she'd filed after her teenage daughter had run away. While attorneys for the mother and the daughter were conferencing the case, attempting to resolve it, ICE agents stood outside the courtroom for a number of hours, and at the conclusion of the proceeding, the ICE agents took the mother away, detained her at the Albany County Jail, and her daughter and son were both placed in foster care while she was detained for over a month and a half. On March 16th, ICE agents arrested the father of a five-year-old as he waited to appear for a child support matter in Brooklyn Family Court. He's the lawful permanent resident, and he was making his second court appearance. And as you referenced, Councilman, on April 19th, Plain Clothes ICE agents arrested a father who was appearing for a visitation matter in Suffolk County Family Court. Even before ICE started to have a presence in family courts, it had often been a challenge to convince our young clients and their families that accessing courts, the family courts, is a viable method of achieving their goals of safety and stability. Security screening at the courthouses, uh, the formality of the courtrooms themselves, the presence of uniformed court officers, and the practice of requiring fingerprints are among the common aspects of court involvement that many might take for granted but can be especially anxiety producing for young immigrant clients. Uh, if you give me just one minute, I'm almost done. Yeah. If you can wrap up, thank yep. you so For much. the first time, weighing ICE and making the decision not to pursue relief to which they're entitled um, is something that's happening with our clients. And frankly, unless we can say to immigrant clients honestly that New York family courts are taking action to keep ICE out of them, we'll continue to make it harder for them to achieve basic human goals of safety and stability. Thank you for that. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Niasa Hickey. I'm a supervising attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services, which is another public defender office. So I hope to sort of, in, in my testimony, answer a few of the questions that came up in the first panel. Um, so as we heard, there are many problems with ICE's courthouse arrests, um, problems that include non-citizens feeling pressure to take pleas when they would have otherwise gone to trial, as is in our written testimony people being, clients being deterred from probation sentences because of um, concerns with probation and immigration enforcement interaction, as well as people being deterred from judi excuse me, judicial diversion programs. So ICE courthouse arrests interfere with efficacy of diversion and treatment programs for vulnerable populations. We heard a lot of testimony about the human trafficking intervention part. Um, I have another example for you. We have a client who was arrested um, while appearing in mental health treatment part. He was complying under the mental health treatment program and doing very well for about nine months. He was arrested and detained in immigration custody based on just a, a 220.03, which is a simple misdemeanor crum, uh, controlled substance possession charge. Um, he's an LPR, and he was detained for seven months facing seizures and other med severe medical problems in immigration detention. Um, his story also highlights the necessity for having immigration lawyers in immigration custody and highlights some of the problems in immigration detention, including lack of health care. He was actually released today under a Second Circuit case that said that the conviction that he was being held on is not actually a deportable conviction. Um, so, what, right, once, and there's also a recent example of Rolanda Meza Espinoza in Hudson County Jail who was, died while he was in immigration custody, and he was arrested actually not based on Immigration and Customs Enforcement looking for him, but they were looking for somebody else. So to go to the question of what, so whether there's mistaken identities, there absolutely is. Ultimately, the surest way for local policymakers to protect immigrant New Yorkers is to reduce court appearances, um, period. And the idea of decreasing uh, the number of court appearances by waiving clients' presence in courts is thoughtful, but it also presents problems when our clients are not there present for the criminal proceedings, which have grave consequences. Um, ultimately, the best response would be to end broken windows policing and to stop low-level arrests. We have to ask, ask ourselves why people who are um, victims of human trafficking or who are, have mental health issues are even appearing in court proceedings to begin with and to decrease those vulnerabilities for non-citizens, we should just look at alternative ways to resolve those issues. Just very briefly, um, 
three, uh, council member, you asked about what the state can do, and there are three active reform campaigns that the city council um, could advocate for, including ending arrests of human trafficking victims and sex workers, um, there's state legislation awaiting Governor Cuomo's signature that would end the unjust arrest of working New Yorkers for carrying tools such as gravity knives, um, and there's state legislation to legalize and regulate sensible marijuana access. Um, so there's much more that I could say, um, but one example of a policy that the court could implement is the one that was implemented in King County in Seattle, which is neutral on its face does not necessarily target immigration and customs enforcement officers, but basically says that um, arrests based solely on immigration status will not happen in the court, and from what we've heard so far, those arrests have, been, have decreased. So that's one idea. Thank you, and for anyone else that wants to, to kind of preempt some of that work as well, to list ideas on the state where the state can do that, would be very helpful. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Yvonne Chen, I'm the manager of outreach at Sanctuary for Families. Um, we are grateful for the New York City Council for the opportunity to testify today and to Councilmember Lanceman for calling this urgent hearing to discuss the crisis triggered by U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement appearances in our city courtrooms. As we have heard today, less than two weeks ago, ICE agents entered the Queens Human Trafficking Intervention Court, a problem-solving court whose goal is to identify trafficking victims and other and offer comprehensive services to assist them in escaping their abuse, not only from the massage parlor owners and brothel keepers who hold them captive, but from the thousands of sex buyers who rape them with impunity. As such, many of the defendants are themselves victims of horrific crimes and feel hopeless about their prospects of getting help. The terrifying appearance of three male ICE agents to detain them rather than to investigate the abuses against them not only failed to protect public safety, by eviscerating the trust the courts have carefully nurtured, ICE aided traffickers in instilling the kind of fear in victims that discourages them from seeking justice. Sanctuary was closely involved in the creation of New York's Human Trafficking Intervention Courts, also known as HTACs, which identify trafficking victims and, and offer them social and legal services as an alternative to criminal conviction. Since the launch of the HTAC, Sanctuary has provided immigration consultations and counseling services to in increasing numbers of victims in Queens and in Brooklyn annually, from 57 in 2014 to 370 in 2016. Among service providers working in the city's trafficking courts, Sanctuary has elicited the highest rates of victim disclosure due to the culturally and linguistically sensitive, um, trauma-informed interviewing techniques utilized by our staff and our pro bono partners. The outcomes reveal a brutal industry that preys upon some of the most defenseless members of society, many of them Chinese and Korean women, most of them mothers, and in some cases grandmothers, who come from impoverished rural communities with little education, hoping to escape abuse in a land that they believed valued human dignity. These women instead have been coerced into providing sexual services through debt bondage and under threats of arrest and deportation. On June 16th, ICE sought to detain one one defendant, a Chinese woman believed to be a trafficking victim, who, like many of the East Asian defendants seen by Sanctuary, had been arrested for unlicensed massage. This young woman was on a track to have the charges against her dismissed after completing her mandated services. Instead, by complying with the legal requirement to appear in court as scheduled, she suddenly risked detention and deportation. All of this occurred in front of dozens of other immigrant defendants in the same situations, and many surely resolved at that moment never to return or complete their services. After court broke for lunch, two Chinese women approached me anxiously, questioning why ICE was there and if they were going to be deported next. They were terrified to even exit the courtroom and asked me to escort them outside so they could get some food, as they had been waiting since early morning for their case to be heard. They panicked and decided to remain huddled inside the courthouse rather than risk arrest. I could tell they were famished, but because they could not bring, themsel they could not bring themselves to step outdoors, the best I could do was bring them some stale bagels. As I sat with them for a few minutes, they wondered how they could possibly finish their sessions and return to court given the risk that doing so could cause them from being deported. The mental health ramifications on a population of immigrants such as those in Queens, scores of whom fled traumatic experiences of state control in China, is chilling. Coming from places where corruption runs rampant, our clients experience overwhelmingly, overwhelming anxiety and paralyzing fear in public systems, especially the justice system. However, having been betrayed by supposed friends who trap them into illicit massage parlors where customers are often permitted to beat, rape, stab, or strangle them for sexual pleasure, fear and suspicion remain high. Unfortunately, the challenge of identifying victims and gaining their trust is getting more difficult 
not less. Given the anti-immigrant sentiment expressed by the current federal administration, non-citizen victims are so terrified of the risk of being deported. Just for reporting their abuse, they choose not to come forward at all. This only makes our city less safe. Immigrant crime victims are driven into the shadows, less likely to report crimes of fear of arrest and deportation, while their exploiters flourish, emboldened with this knowledge. Sorry. An extra layer of fear that they can use to coerce their victims into submission, and it weakens the efforts of service providers, who can no longer reassure clients that they will be safe in the courts. Immigrant victims must not be allowed to believe that their traffickers, what their traffickers tell them is truth. If you try to escape and seek help, the American government will arrest you and lock you up instead. Our current rooms must remain a sanctuary for victims and crime, victims of crime seeking justice. Thank you for listening to this testimony and thank you for your work on behalf of our most vulnerable clients. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Pera Lopez. I am an organizer at McDowell, New York. Uh, thank you to the City Council for creating this opportunity for testimony and the harmful impact of the recent ICE enforcement in New York State. Courts. Um, Make the Road New York is the largest immigrant route, grassroots immigrant organization in New York City working to build the power of Latin, Latinx and working class communities to achieve dignity and justice through organizing policy innovation, uh, transformative education and survival for services. We tackle the critical issues facing our community, including workers' rights, tenants' rights, language access, LGBTQ justice, healthcare access, youth development, and immigrant civil rights. Uh, as we all are aware, immigrant communities are under attack the fear felt by our members and clients are palpable when they enter our offices and ask whether it's safe to travel, to go to work, to drive, or show up to the court date, a question we are receiving more and more often. New York City has been a national leader championing policies to solve the separation of immigrant families by ending their collaboration with ISIS in humane enforcement activities. We must do everything we can as a city to stop ICE from entering our courthouses and creating a culture of fear in our justice system. Recently, one of our members spoke at an immigration committee at the city hall, city council about her story. Her husband, partner, and father of her children was picked up by eyes in front of their eyes outside the courthouse after a court appearance. He was recently denied bond and will be deported. The family is suffering endless pain and hardship. Also, another of the clients who is an company minor flee, fleeing violence in Guatemala with a pending application for a special immigrant juvenile status was arrested in criminal court reporting on probation and is now in detention. Many of our clients and members are now scared to go to family courts as well as criminal courts. Our ICE presence in our courts is terrible public policy and creates clear disincentive to show up to court appearance. News, tra news travel fast in these days and age. Our communities know about Ms. Gonzalez, a transgender woman who from Texas who was detained by courthouse while attempting to obtain an order of protection against our abuser. ICE presence in our halls is in, of justice sends the message that immigrants are being risk of crime are not even safe of reporting crimes. The city must explore all options within its power to prevent ICE from making arrests in any courthouse. Immigrant New Yorkers are living in constant fear. New York City must continue to lead the nation and stand up for him inhumane and unjust immigration presence in our courthouse. Thank you for your leadership and continuing dedication for these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Alan Keller, an associate professor at NYU School of Medicine, NYU Gallatin School of Individualized Study, and I direct the Bellevue NYU Program for Survivors of Torture and the NYU Center for Health and Human Rights. So thank you so much for holding these hearings at a time when it seems we really need to be reminded that we are a society, a city, a nation based on the rule of law, uh, the uh, fairly applied, and fundamental tenets of decency and humanity. And we seem to have uh, forgotten that. Um, President Trump has added a new level of vitriol and hatred uh, you know, uh, to paraphrase uh, Mark Twain's statement, you know, there are lies, damned lies, and then there are President Trump's tweets. And among those tweets are the lies that it, undocumented immigrants are a harm or a danger, which it just isn't borne out by the facts, uh, that all indi individuals are axe murderers or pedophiles waiting to happen. 
we must use the detention and the ICE system to protect our, ourselves and, and appropriately detain. But the way it is being applied is like using a sledgehammer to open up an egg. And this has harmful effects, devastatingly harmful health consequences for the individual, the community, and the society. For the individual, that trauma that some of my colleagues here described of being detained uh, and that fear, uh, and also, as has been mentioned, and I actually uh, was one of the co-authors of a Human Rights Re Watch report on deaths in detention. So I can tell you, not only is the health care or the lack thereof in ICE facilities potentially harmful to one's health, it's potentially fatal. Uh, so both for trauma and health care, or lack thereof, it's really problematic. Uh, for the community, this ripple effect of fear and terror. As somebody who's cared for torture victims, I've learned that when one individual in the community is tortured, and frankly what's happening in these cruel and inhuman roundups or, and, and uh, assaults in our places of safety in the courts, is, is tantamount, if not to torture, to cruel and inhuman and degrading treatment. Uh, and it has to stop. So it's harmful to our community. How can you be, have a safe community when people don't feel safe to report crimes, when people don't feel safe to participate in the legal system, when people don't feel safe to go for health care? Uh, and that has impact both for the individual and for the community. And then as a society, we're wasting our resources. We need our resources spent where there's really bang for the buck. Our resources are being spent on swapping out the war on drugs for the war on immigrants. This is about feeding the seven-headed immigration detention hydra and nothing less. The situation, I fear, is getting worse. As Al Jolson, the son or an immigrant himself, had said, we ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, what we're seeing, where individuals, when they go for their asylum hearings, are, are, are taken into custody, is, is just going to escalate. So what can we do? What can you do? So number one, I would plead with you, just as there is a presumed right to representation in criminal proceedings, there must be maintained, and you must fight tooth and nail, including any proposals by the mayor, or anybody else to undermine that core value. Because I'll tell you, I'm not sure how many heroes there are in this whole thing, but some of the heroes are my attorney colleagues who've represented these folks. And the other thing I'd like to see, which I'm spearheading with colleagues, is to make sure that all undocumented immigrants not only have access to health care, which Bellevue, where I've spent my career and public hospitals are dedicated to, but through a system of the immigrant health advocacy uh, program, which uh, I'm spearheading, that anyone in immigration proceedings has access to a health professional to document the harmful effects of wearing an ankle bracelet, the harmful effects of not getting your medications, as was described, and the trauma to that individual and the family uh, of this detention. So I must ask you to stand strong to the, those in Washington and perhaps even those here in New York City. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much. Um, so you were in the, uh, in the human trafficking court the day that, that, that I showed up? I was. Yeah. You know, it, it, it has to be mentioned, I don't think it has been, um, but how fortunate I think that woman was that she was in the courtroom with a judge as sympathetic and empathetic um, and courageous as uh, Judge Sarita, who did what needed to be done to, to, to protect her. Um, and one of the things that we are hoping to see from OCA and hoping to see to come out of this process is that the, the rights of uh, people in our courts are not dependent on landing in the right judge on the right day when ICE uh, shows up. Uh, thank you all very much for your testimony and for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you. After this. Good. Okay, our next panel. Karina Alomar from the Latino Lawyers Association of Queens. Frida Guerdas, 
the Hispanic Federation, Jose Perez, Latino Justice, Albert Kahn from CARE New York, and Michael Snow from the Anti-Defamation League. We have seats for everyone? Good. Okay. Um, same uh, guidance. If you can do it within three minutes, we would appreciate it. But if, you, if you've got to do five minutes, we understand. You all raise your right hand. <clears throat> do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Right. Thank you all very much. Would you like to lead off? You have to hit the button. Good afternoon, Chairs Menchacha, Landsman, and distinguished council members. My name is Karina Alomar. I am the immediate past president of the Latino Lawyers Association of Queens County. I am a private defense attorney, and I'm here to testify on behalf of our members and our current president, Catalina Cruz. The Latino Lawyers Association of Queens County was formed in 1996. The purpose was to promote the general welfare and legal rights of the Latino community and advance the opportunities that exist for Latino legal professionals. Our organization is made up of more than 100 attorneys, including private practitioners, members of legal service agencies, judges, professors, and students. We support our members through continuing education courses and networking and our community through our street law and Espanol outreach programs as well as referrals. A significant number of our members work within the criminal justice system as defense attorneys, assistant uh, district attorneys and judges. Under past administrations, ICE's presence inside the courthouse was infrequent and often limited to the lodging of immigration detainers against our clients until New York City enacted the detainer law. Under our current president, we have seen a bold and often uh, drastic shift in the enforcement of immigration laws, which most recently included ICE's visit to the Queens County Human Trafficking Intervention Court a courtroom that was created specifically to provide victims of sexual slavery with a real opportunity for a better life. According to the administration at NICE, their enforcement efforts are meant to remove so-called criminal aliens. But this last incident demonstrates that contrary to their claims, and it raises a number of public safety and constitutional concerns. As officers of the court, we understand that there are laws and consequences to the violation of the laws. However, violations of civil immigration laws carry consequences at par with the violation of criminal laws, but not with the same constitutional protections. As practitioners, we are afraid for what type of enforcement will mean for our clients and must get creative in order to protect them. For example, both in criminal and in family court, we now go in and do not call our clients' names. In criminal court, we may ask for bail detention for our clients so that ICE does not come in and pick them up and deport them. Alarmingly, ICE has also made appearances in family court, creating dangerous situations for children and mixed status families. When, for example, there have been neglect uh, situations where one parent uh, is undocumented and they are afraid to let the courts know that their child may be uh, their child safety may be at issue with the other parent I fear for my own clients I have a client that called me this morning who told me 
My husband said that he's going to call immigration if I continue with my divorce. So please do not do anything for my divorce. Let him take everything. So she's walking away after a 30-year marriage with no, none of his retirement benefits. She's walking away from a house that has equity over 500000 with nothing because she is too afraid to go to court because he has threatened her with deportation. It cannot be overstated that ISIS presence in the city's courtrooms will also significantly impact the public safety of our community. We are concerned that the progress made in New York City by detainer laws, municipal identification cards, and other sanctuary city policies will be undermined by the outrageous immigration enforcement tactics. As an association, we are committed to continuing to educate our community and our colleagues about the changes in immigration law and enforcement practices so that we can all be prepared. And although we understand that these are federal principles and the Council's ability here may be limited, we thank you for shedding light on the issue and ask you to continue to creatively think of ways to protect New Yorkers as well as support legal services and organizations that represent and educate our immigrant uh, community. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Member. Thank you for inviting Latino Justice Pearl Deaf. As you know, Latino Justice Pearl Deaf is a civil rights legal defense fund founded back in 1972. We are unfortunately all too familiar with the Immigration and Customs Enforcement and their uh, at best, one could describe rogue immigration enforcement activities as currently manifested by their ar uh, arrest activities in our courts. Um, back in, 19 in 2007, we sued ICE for engaging in rogue immigration home raids here in New York, in Long Island, and in Westchester and the Hudson Valley. ICE, while attempting to execute administrative immigration warrants, which only permit a consensual entry into a home or residence, would forcibly enter and break into these homes. After protracted litigation, ICE ended up settling that lawsuit, paying, over, uh, paying $1 million in damages to the plaintiffs who suffered this, some of whom were U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents, and also reforming their home raids practices. You now hear ICE say they do not engage in home raids, but in immigration enforcement activities. ICE's current practices of, of, of seeking to arrest immigrant New Yorkers in our courts based upon nothing more than an immigration warrant is equally egregious, offensive, illegal, and similarly violates our nation, state, and city's notions of equality and access to justice for all. ICE continues to refuse to recognize courts as a sensitive location as they treat or deem hospitals, schools, churches, and houses of worship where they typically will not seek to engage in immigration enforcement activities absent exigent circumstances. ICE is, as you know, one of three agencies with the Department of Homeland Security whose mandate is primarily to respond, is responsible for enforcing federal immigration law. Their mandate is to arrest the detention and deportation of individuals the agency believes are subject to the removal from the interior of the U.S. Part of the problem here, my, the focus that I would like to, to bring is ICE, the court system, the Office of Court Administra Administration's treatment of ICE as law enforcement or police officers. As we know, that is somewhat misleading. Immigration is a civil administrative matter. Immigration warrants are typically civil or administrative or detainers issued by the agency themselves. They are not court orders or judicial warrants of removal signed by a magistrate. The Fourth Amendment requires that probable cause determinations must be made by a neutral magistrate that is detached from the activities of law, law enforcement. However, ICE immigration detainers and warrants issued in civil immigration removal proceedings are either signed by ICE's own immigration judges or agency officials who claim to have made a, a probable cause determination. This is as if the NYPD could say they could issue their own arrest warrants rather than applying to a, a court of appropriate jurisdiction and having a judge review and determine whether there is in fact probable cause to arrest someone. Represent, New York represent, Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez has stated that the ability of ICE or to pose as a local police officer is a flaw in our system which keeps our community, uh, which instead of keeping our community safe, fuels fear, undermines trust, and ultimately further mar marginalizes our immigrant neighbors. Congresswoman Velasquez has introduced the bill in April to amend Section 287 287 of the INA to prohibit DHS ICE or ICE agents from wearing clothing or other items um, saying that they are police. 
In terms of the issue about sensitive locations, courthouses unfortunately do not fall within this uh, 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 sensitive locations. New York Congressman Adriano Espaillat and Jose Serrano also earlier this year introduced legislation to protecting sensitive locations aimed at codifying and expanding ICE's current administrative policies, uh, protecting sensitive locations to include courthouses. Um, given what has transpired and occurred, as a Latino civil rights organization, we are very much concerned to learn that the police chiefs of Los Angeles, Houston, and other jurisdictions have reported dramatic decreases in the number of Latinos reporting rapes, other violent crimes of victims of domestic violence, fearful, as my colleague just testified, of attempting to uh, 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 enforce, effectuate their rights. We've seen in El Diario and the Daily News landlords threatening tenants to check on their status and report them. This is not just this is, a, this is an issue affecting all immigrant New Yorkers across the board in all our courts. The suggestions we have or recommendations that we would make, we ask that our governor and our attorney general and the Office of Court Administration deem all New York State courthouses sensitive locations, even if ICE or the federal government will not. Secondly, the, chief, the Office of Court Administration must promulgate a policy that will bar ICE agents from going into our courthouses and making immigration arrests unless they have a judicially prescribed arrest warrant duly signed by a magistrate or a judge. A judicial warrant defined as a warrant issued by a magistrate sitting in the judicial branch of local, state, and federal government. And as my colleagues uh, uh, testified earlier, one, third, OCA should and the chief administrative judge should bar court employees from assisting or cooperating with ICE agents unless they have a court order or judicial warrant. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Frida. I'm here with Hispanic Federation. Um, Chair Lankman and committee members, we thank you again for this opportunity to testify, not just on behalf of Hispanic Federation, but also on the more than 60 Latino-led community-based organizations that we represent. Uh, today, Hispanic Federation actually joins Latino justice in calling on the city council to urge Chief Judge DeFiore and Chief Administrative Judge Marks to protect immigrant New Yorkers and their families and restore trust in the judicial court system, in the state court system. For more than two decades now, the Federation has been working tirelessly to advocate for the passage of humane and fair immigration reform in our nation's capital. So we all know recent directives from the federal government have magnified the scope and impact of uh, immigration enforcement in this nation. Uh, we see this everywhere. It's manifesting in what exactly the conversation we're having today. It increases fears and anxieties in the immigrant community, especially regarding the presence of ICE officers in many safe spaces. Among them, state courthouses, which have long been spaces for all Americans to claim legal recourse and relief, regardless of immigration status. We know that since February 2017, uh, ICE officers have been showing up unannounced to courthouses, not just in New York State, but in Texas, Florida, and Colorado. Um, in New York State, at least 38 ICE apprehensions and attempted apprehensions have occurred near or at a courthouse. Of those, at least 19 um, apprehensions and nine attempted apprehensions have taken place in New York City. Um, ICE agents have approached individuals, um, as we've mentioned before, um, once they left the courtroom, not only in the hallways, but also outside on the front steps and possibly, um, and as well, on their way over to the subway after leaving the courthouse. It's really no surprise that immigrants fear uh, the courthouse um, as a building uh, right now and by association that they fear the legal justice system. Um, Hispanic Federation, we we have public education campaigns very often. We recently launched one called uh, Know Your Rights. Um, it's a massive public education campaign that reached all of New York City, New York State, and beyond. We talked to thousands of immigrants who called in about their rights. And uh, we recorded that over 20% of them uh, expressed apprehension over their safety when traveling to government buildings. Uh, that actually manifested in callers saying that they were afraid that they would not be protected from immigration officers in traffic court, family court. We got questions like, should I show up to my next uh, hearing? Um, I have a ticket, but should I go to court? And we, we know that the answer is and you shouldn't go to court, right? But they do have valid fears, um, and they are um, up against a lot. So we're aware that many of the immigrants that have called our hotline have chosen to miss court dates out of fear of being apprehended by ICE. Um, in fact, the immigrant community has definitely shown increased fear and hesitancy in reporting crimes at all, uh, backed by a lot of other testimonies. Um, so this massive disengagement with the American justice system we know is a grave matter. 
especially when affected individuals are victims of domestic violence and victims of assault. Uh, not appearing before the court impairs the effectiveness of our justice system and will undermine the safety of all New Yorkers. So in our over 25 year history, um, Hispanic Federation has supported millions of Hispanic children, youth and family via broad based coalitions. Uh, so we know our community well, we know that immigrants um, in our city and state just want to build better lives, go to school, um, have work opportunities. And so by permitting ICE presence at, near and at courthouses, we're shutting out some of those, the most vulnerable members of our society who are very often in need of judicial recourse. Um, as a sanctuary city, our goal should be to protect immigrants from being detained and deported. Um, we are not doing that by, um, by continuing the policies that we have today. We um, join Latino Justice in um, all of their asks. We're asking that the OCA deem all New York, New York State courthouses sensitive locations, that they promulgate a policy barring ICE agents from making arrests in NYS courthouses, and that OCA court employees be prohibited from assisting and cooperating with ICE agents. So, of course, we all need to work to work together in order to eliminate all these barriers that prevent immigrants in our communities from reporting crime, participating in the courts, and performing their civic duties. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Albert Kahn. I serve as the legal director for CARE New York, the Council on American Islamic Relations. I'm here to say that New York must take immediate action to make sure our courthouses remain open to all. And I applaud Speaker Mark Viverito, Chairman Lanzman, and Chairman Manchaca for calling for action on this vital matter. Today, my oral remarks are an excerpt of the longer written statement we have submitted into the record. ICE's courthouse arrests are not merely unjust, they may actually be unconstitutional. And speaking just hours before the resumption of President Trump's Muslim ban, it is quite obvious why this is of special concern for New York's Muslim community. As the Supreme Court has repeatedly stated, the Tenth Amendment prohibits the federal government from commandeering any state to enforce federal laws or regulatory programs. To put it simply, ICE cannot force New York to do its job. Just as the federal government cannot compel the NYPD to conduct immigration raids, and just as it cannot compel this council to enact immigration bans, it cannot transform our courts and prosecutors into instrumentalities of immigration enforcement. The constitutional concerns are clearest when ICE arrests those who have been subpoenaed by prosecutors, arresting New Yorkers who have been compelled by our state to be present at a time and place where ICE can detain them. This tactic turns executive branch officials into an indispensable component of ICE's in immigration enforcement strategy. Such a co-option of state subpoena power seriously compromises the integrity of our court system and centuries-old experiment with federalism. Congress has not authorized such a tactic. Our Constitution forbids it, and so our state must now put an end to these arrests. ICE's conduct also raises serious issues of public accountability. Immigration enforcement in state courthouses by a federal agency with a history of impersonating state and municipal police forces creates a clear impression of state cooperation with the federal immigration program. Our Constitution prohibits federal programs that mislead the public in this way since they disrupt democratic accountability. The Tenth Amendment forbids programs like this which wrongly lead the public to hold state officials culpable for decisions of federal authorities. ICE's transformation of state courthouses into traps for undocumented immigrants thus places state officials into a situation where the maintenance of a core state function implicitly compels them to submit to cooperation with the federal program. ICE's decision to disregard constitutional boundaries and undermine the state judicial system simply cannot be tolerated. In light of the foregoing, we urge the city and state officials to do everything in their power to block ICE enforcement in New York's courthouses. I thank you for giving me this opportunity to address these urgent issues, and I look forward to working with the Council to safeguard the rights of all Muslim New Yorkers and all immigrant New Yorkers in the months and years to come. I should have had you go first. You set a good example. <laughs> no pressure, please. I'll do my best to follow suit. Good afternoon, Chairman Lansman, Chairman Mshaka. My name is Michael Snow. I'm here as the Assistant Director of the Anti-Defamation League in New York. Since 1913, the mission of the Anti-Defamation League has been to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. 
We're dedicated to combating anti-Semitism, prejudice, bigotry of all kinds, as well as defending democratic ideals and civil rights. ADL has also historically fought for just and humane immigration policies. We also have vast experience dealing with law enforcement. We're the largest non-governmental trainer of law enforcement, and we've trained over 100,000 federal, state, and local law enforcement personnel in just the past 10 years on hate crimes, extremism, terrorism, ethics, and core values. This puts us in a unique place to address the relationship between law enforcement and the community, and it's also why we're here today to express our deep concern about ICE enforcement in New York City courts, stemming from the current administration's aggressive deportation policy, which has led to this escalation. Members of the community, regardless of immigration or citizenship status, need to be able to contact local police and authorities and access our justice system without fear of deportation. We're concerned that increased ICE activity in courthouses will deny vulnerable victims and individuals access to justice as they're deterred from contacting authorities and using the justice system when needed, such as in the event of a hate crime. ICE's pursuit of domestic violence victims, sexual assault, hate crimes in courts uh, risks sending the message to other victims that they too might be at risk of deportation if they come forward or even witnesses or anyone using the judicial system. Crime increases when members of the community are afraid to turn to police and the justice system for protection, and perpetrators feel emboldened and unafraid of consequences. This is why we also feel that courthouses should be treated as sensitive areas akin to houses of worship and schools. And we urge the New York City Council to ask the chief judge and chief administrative judge to take steps to bar ICE enforcement actions at New York State courthouses and preserve equal access to our justice system. As has been said, I think this is going to take a multi-pronged approach. Just this week, we hosted a training for staff members of Latin American consulates on hate crimes and bringing them together with the Hate Crimes Task Force of the NYPD. I encourage you to consider our written testimony, which expands upon these issues, and I thank you very much for your consideration and the time. Very good. Um, now, CARE and ADL, you're both national organizations. Are you aware of other jurisdictions that are uh, maybe being more aggressive in limiting ICE's access to, to the courts? Any models out there or any jurisdictions that in some way, shape, or form are doing something that we could bring into New York? It's a good question. I can say that as uh, the local or the New York chapter of a national organization, we're also in touch with colleagues who can share with us what they're seeing in their parts of the country. And in our written testimony, it, we mention the effect this has had in places like Los Angeles, Boston, and Miami, where we are seeing reported decrease in reporting of cases of sexual assault and domestic violence. I understand. Violence. The question is, are you aware of any other jurisdictions, any other court systems <clears throat> that are restricting ICE's ability in some way that we can see what they're doing and, and maybe have New York do that. And if the answer is no, that's okay, but I, since you're both representatives of national organizations, I thought you might know. So I actually reached out to my colleagues nationwide about this, and so far we have found a lot of symbolic actions taken against ICE enforcement, but we have yet to find uh, jurisdictions that have been willing to take a more concrete stance. And we really think there's an incredible opportunity here for New York to lead the way by taking a more aggressive posture. And I will say, as far as the Tenth Amendment argument, it's something that New York led the way on in the past. We set case law in 1992, went to the Supreme Court as a way to vindicate our state interest. I think there is an opening for us to really be a what model. It, just help us out. What are you referring to there? Uh, it was a case that dealt with a regulatory program created by the federal government regarding radioactive waste disposal. It was a highly technical issue, but the question uh, the core question was whether the state could be compelled to facilitate the uh, with a federal program. And there the court took a very strong line in favor of New York's rights to refuse to take part in that federal program. And here it's different. Uh, it, it is a different fact pattern. But I think by going after the co-option of the subpoena power as a quasi-executive uh, governmental function, there is case law that would actually support um, either the Attorney General taking a, uh, proactive litigation or as a defensive strategy to protect the OCA if they chose to implement a more restrictive program. 
Councilmember, I would just say one other thing. Um, as you heard the speaker say uh, at, this, at the press conference outside last Thursday, um, New York should be in the vanguard and doing more to protect its and not following the lead. We should be, uh, 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 if we are truly a state uh, interested in protecting our immigrant residents, we should, we, we should be taking the initiative and lead on this. Amen. I have, I have a question, Jose, to you specifically on uh, in your, your testimony, you allude to a very famous case, uh, suing ICE, and thinking about the kind of future litigation that could be before us, how, how do you think we can, we can think about casework? How are you all preparing to kind of think about casework, one? And then, and then two, you brought up another case or uh, a point around law enforcement and the de definition of law enforcement and where these, these are civil, essentially civil, civil administrators uh, within ICE as a, as a jurisdiction. Is there a case, is there kind of uh, a case that we can build that can further define that to really remove their access as, as what we can deem as, as law enforcement? Is that, is that, is that a, lo a kind of avenue for, for work? Um, as to your first question, um, and again, I think there were suggestions early in, in the first panel from uh, Tina and others um, that uh, why, could, why could not New York or the court system or the Attorney General's office bring an affirmative lawsuit um, declaring that, in fact, um, that ICE's policy of attempting to engage in uh, effectuate immigra civil immigration arrests, um, uh, seek a declaratory judgment that that violates the state's sovereignty in running its own courts and they cannot compel the court system uh, to comply or, or assist or facilitate in their immigration enforcement activities. So there is, I think, fertile ground in terms of trying to bring affirmative litigation or the other alternative uh, uh, is to pass, or uh, as I suggested, declare our courts uh, uh, sensitive locations and bar ICE from coming in and let the federal government sue us. As, as I think, again, the Constitution is the Constitution irrespective of what the feds believe they can or cannot do. And it is up to our courts, again, to interpret the Constitution and protect our rights. In terms of your, your second question, um, again, there have been a number of court decisions around the country already in terms of this, what we call detainers. Detainers are a mere piece of paper issued by an ICE immigration enforcement official that says they have determined that, that the pr subject of that detainer uh, they have probable cause that his person is here without permission or authority and that he is that person is removable again courts have determined that local law enforcements that honor those detainers those de th those detentions are volatile or fourth amendment right constitutional rights to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures immigration warrants in the context of the Aguilar the home raids case again we've heard immigration immigration proceedings are civil an immigration warrant Immigration judges are part of the federal government. They're part of the Executive Office of Immigration Review. Um, uh, uh, they are not necessarily magistrates or judges of record, uh, what we call Article Three judges in the federal courts who would typically uh, do this. So again, there is, I think, existing case law precedent that would, I think, uh, that substantiates the points or the positions that I made in, 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 in terms of the questions that you ask, and therefore I think the court system, our chief judge should feel comfortable, and if not, perhaps she may want to consult with the attorney general as the state's chief law enforcement officer and attorney in terms of seeking advisory opinion that, in fact, New York can, under the Tenth Amendment, resist and refuse and, and not honor these pieces of paper, detainers or immigration warrants. It is very different, again, from a, a police officer officer coming in with a court order or arrest warrant issued by, signed by a judge versus an agency attempting to enforce, engage in civil immigration enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Good. Thank you all very much. That's it. <clears throat> Our closing panel. Catherine um, Bajuk. NYCDS, Dan Kinsey, A Womankind, I don't know if that's Dan, I'm, I apologize if that's not correct, and Heidi Hoffinger, Red Umbrella Project.
Ready? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you very much. Would you like to lead off? Here we go. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Bayouk. I'm the mental health specialist attorney at New York County Defender Services, and I'm here to talk to you today about a non-citizen client who had very serious mental health and cognitive issues and who suffered needless trauma because of her arrest by ICE in the courthouse. Her original charges were downgraded because of our system's evolution towards treating rather than punishing those with mental illness. And she received a misdemeanor offer and plea and was sentenced to compliance with mental health treatment. This changed her life for the first time ever. She saw a psychiatrist regularly. She took prescribed medication. She was able to repair relationships with family and friends. She learned a vocation. The person I'd met in the interview booth who was barking and spitting and cursing had blossomed into someone who was finally well enough and felt safe enough to finally feel hope. I'm gonna call her JP. Um, her case was pending for about a year and ICE never bothered with her once until last spring, her only court date after the inauguration, when ICE came to arrest her in the courthouse. I tried to stop them, the ICE agents, from doing this. I told them about her cognitive issues and how it rendered her like a child. I told them she suffered PTSD from being a rape victim, a victim of multiple sexual assaults and domestic violence and the trauma of having family murdered in her home country. I told them about how she tried to kill herself on numerous occasions, that she suffered from depression and anxiety, um, and that she was now being cared for by a psychiatrist and was taking medication and doing very well. And so I asked them in light of all that, could we voluntarily surrender her instead of having this arrest in the courthouse? No. Then I basically was begging them, well, how about then, instead of taking her to detention, why don't you take her to a hospital? because this was going to be a traumatic event sufficient enough to risk a psychotic break. They refused, one just shrugged. They wouldn't even tell me their names or show me any paperwork. When we told JP that ICE was there for her, she began crying and shaking uncontrollably and she clutched my hand like she was afraid to let it go. After she saw the judge, we tried to escort her from the courtroom, but ICE stopped us and they were helped by a court officer, mind you. I had to pry her fingers from my hand and they pulled her away, crying and shaking. And despite her obvious special needs and our saying, look, she, let us just stand here while you, while you cuff her, they excluded us from the double doors where the arrest took place. Before they took her away, we tried to give them the letter we had from her psychiatrist which detailed her trauma and her treatment, including the name of the medication she needed. They refused to accept us. I finally tucked it into her pocket as they led her away. When she was taken by ICE that day, people in the courtroom were visibly upset. At least one person was crying. I heard someone say, well, I'm gonna tell people I know not to come to court because ICE is gonna take them too. At a time where our criminal justice system is finally evolving to treat rather than punish those with mental illness and offer hope instead of jail, we cannot allow ICE in our courtroom. We cannot allow people like JP to risk interruption of their treatment and medication and risk further needless trauma because of ICE. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Dr. Heidi Hofinger, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Kingston University in London and also John Jay College of Criminal Justice here in New York City. And we're involved in conducting a large international study that's looking at the social and legal interventions taking place around migration, trafficking, and prostitution. Here in New York City, in order to carry out this research, I'm working with a community-based organization called Red Umbrella Project, who serves key populations, and that's who I'm here representing um, today. Red Umbrella Project is an advocacy group for people in the sex trades. They have been conducting research on the human trafficking intervention courts since their inception, and in 2014, they uh, published a peer-led observational report on the first year of the courts 
and it was titled Criminal Victim or Worker, The Effects of New York's Human Trafficking Courts on Adults Charged with Prostitution-Related Offenses. And um, I would just like to provide a, sh a very brief statement from Run Umbrella Project today. ICE presence outside of the human trafficking intervention courts only serves to further harm the victims that the courts claim to serve. Often foreign nationals engage in the sex trades to escape abuse, genocide, oppressive regimes, transphobia, and other forms of terror. One of the most valuable services that stem from the human trafficking intervention courts is the obtaining of T visas through social service agencies that survivors of the courts are mandated to. These T visas help to ensure that people who may suffer harm or even death in their countries of origin can regularize their immigration status and stay in the United States. For these reasons, we implore that New York City and the human trafficking courts ban ICE from being present in or near the courts. Please honor the mission of the human trafficking courts in protecting the most vulnerable and not treating victims as criminals. Thank you. Um, do you have a question, Carlos? Yeah. Sure. I just, I, I want to ask, um, this is our last panel, and you, you've heard most of what was discussed today. Is there one, one thing that kind of pops up that, uh, you know, both of you kind of focus on different, different aspects of the mental health component and how important it is uh, to kind of think about, about uh, mental health in terms of the impacts and, and really a kind of focused population within the human trafficking courts. Uh, is there anything that popped up today that was especially, um, that could be impactful to the communities right now that can begin to show uh, a, a kind of real, a real effort, not just by the council, possibly the state and the government and potentially the chief, the chief judge? Um, I just, I think, you know, one of the key messages that, that community, the, the, of those folks who are involved in the sex trades is this idea of stopping treating victims as criminals so that we don't, um, you know, people who are potential victims of trafficking and violence, that they don't have to become court involved in order to receive services. And for folks who end up in the commercial sex trades for a variety of other reasons, the, the sex worker communities uh, across the board are fighting for decriminalization. Um, and this is gaining momentum at the global level as well. Um, so. And if I could just stress, I don't know that there's anything right now that gives any hope for my clients who are criminally charged, mentally ill people. Just to add, the judge in the courtroom stopped the action in the entire court for half an hour because she was trying to help, and she called all the judges she knew, she called the administrative judge, and she called me up and said, there's nothing I can do. The case is on for sentencing, she's fulfilled every condition, I can't put her in today. And there is just this helplessness among some of the judges who do want to help our, our non-citizen clients um, who are being pursued by ICE. And just to be clear, my client had a record from before, all minor things. She even had a felony conviction, low-level drug felony. Um, the case where she pled guilty to the misdemeanor, it was a misdemeanor, it was petty larceny um, at that point. Um, she, I just feel like it's low-hanging fruit and these people are being victimized. Thank you. Well, thank you to both. Thank you both very much. Thank you for waiting. <laughs> thank you for what you do and, and thank you for adding that, uh, that perspective. Thank you thank for your you. time. Have a nice day. With that, um, our hearing is concluded. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.